This hearing is now called to order. Um, so, good morning. Yeah, you all made it through the raindrops. <laughs> all right. So I want to start by thanking Council Member Ayala. Um, she's a great partner to have to work with. And I want to say good morning to everyone else. And thank you for coming. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. As my esteemed colleague um, will tell you, we are conducting today's joint oversight hearing on mental health services for LGBTQ plus youth. I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his commitment to the youth of New York City, as well as for his dedication to reducing poverty throughout New York City. I would also like to thank all of the advocates who are here today and who are not here today, youth programs and, and youth program providers, and all those who came to testify today on this important topic. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. Okay. <laughs> Chair, Chair Ayala. <laughs> they will be here. I promise they will get here. Today, both committees will take a deep dive into the available mental health services that exist within New York City for LGBTQ plus youth. As Chair Ayala um, will talk about, I'm sure, mental health and sexual orientation and or gender identity are highly interrelated. Although mental health issues can occur within anyone, regardless of age, race, gender, or ethnicity, LGBTQ plus individuals, and more specifically, LGBTQ plus youth, are more likely to experience a mental health condition and more than four times more likely to attempt suicide, experience suicidal thoughts, and engage in self-harm more so than their heterosexual peers. In performing this oversight, I would like to emphasize that being LGBTQ plus alone does not put a person at higher risk for mental health disorders and or suicide. It is the discrimination, rejection, fear, and harassment that may come with being LG LGBTQ plus that increases this risk. And when you add it in, and when you add in stigma, that is often associated with mental illness, LGBTQ plus youth are much less likely than their heterosexual peers to open up about their feelings or seek help. This is why there is a critical need for mental health services for LGBTQ plus youth in the city. Today we will be examining the available mental health programs and services that DYCD, there's too many acronyms, Department of Youth and Community Development, and DOHMH, you can, you can talk about that one, <laughs> offer these youth, as well as the ways in which LGBTQ plus youth are made aware of these resources. DYCD has a long history of contracting out to providers in efforts to provide holistic programs and services that shape the general individual. However, specialized services geared toward addressing LGBTQ plus youth mental health needs are critically needed. I do want to acknowledge that through DYCD's runaway and homeless um, youth programming, which includes crisis services, borough-based drop-in centers, transitional independent living, and street outreach, that there is some provision of mental health services in runaway and homeless youth. As we know that runaway and homeless youth disproportionately identify as LGBTQ+. In addition to runaway and homeless youth programming, in fiscal year 2019, the Trans Equity Program Initiative, which is administered by DYCD and DOHMH, was awarded 1.8 million to sustain education programs, legal guidance, employment services, workforce development, and health services for transgender and gender non-conforming individuals. This initiative is the first of its kind that benefits solely the transgender community. As a chair of the Youth Services Committee, I have an obligation to the youth of this city, 
to help them receive robust and comprehensive mental health services. In addition, we should recognize and celebrate the diversity of this city, especially those who are LGBTQ+, as June is Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. And this year will represent the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, which will forever represent a pivotal moment in history for LGBTQ plus liberation. To end, I would like to affirm that different does not mean bad. In fact, different means great most times. It can mean that diverse groups of people come together and embrace their differences and share in their ways of living. We as a city know that diversity and difference are what makes this city so vibrant and colorful. That is why we as a city have a duty to serve LGBTQ plus youth when they are in need of mental health services. So I look forward to hearing the testimony today from the administration and the advocates, as well as from the youth who have bravely joined us today to testify. I would like to thank my staff, Issa Rogers, Christian Ravello, and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, Michelle Peregrine, and Elizabeth Arts. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Debbie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'd like to thank my colleague, Councilmember Deborah Rose, Chair of the Committee on Youth Services, for co-sponsoring this hearing with me today. Today, we are here to learn about mental services for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer youth, and their related communities, including, but not limited to, questioning, intersex, curious, asexual, straight allies, youth providers, and advocates, LGBTQ+, youth, and other interested members of the public. Although mental health issues can occur in anyone, regardless of age, race, gender, or ethnicity, individuals are, that are LGBTQ+, are far more likely to experience mental health conditions than that of their heterosexual and cisgender peers. Research suggests that LGBTQ individuals face these health disparities because they are far more likely to experience societal stigma, discrimination, denial of civil and human rights, as well as face barriers in accessing adequate physical and mental health care. LGBTQ plus youth are at greater risk for depression, suicide, substance use, and nationally, uh, nearly one third, 29% of LGBTQ plus youth have attempted suicide at least once in, their prior, in the prior year compared to 6% of heterosexual youth. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene reported that the rate of attempted suicide was 32% among New York City youth who have been bullied on school grounds in the past 12 months and identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or were not sure of their sexual identity. One in three transgender youth in New York City have seriously thought about taking their lives and two in five report having made a suicide attempt in the past 12 months. New York City LGBTQ plus youth and youth, uh, and youth who were not sure of their sexual identity attempted suicide at significantly higher rates in comparison to heterosexual youth. Na and nationally, LGBTQ youth who experience rejection at home are 8.4 times as likely to have attempted suicides as LGBTQ plus peers who reported no or low levels of family rejection. While we know that individuals that identify as LGBTQ plus are often faced with stigma and discrimination, when they seek health care, they also know that suicide is preventable if supportive adults identify warning signs and help to guide young people who are at risk towards the, uh, sorry, my glasses are not fixed, mm -hmm. towards the protective factors that keep LGBTQ individuals safe. To address these issues, the City Council in fiscal year 2019 invested $1.2 million for LGBTQ plus youth mental health. That funding is administered by DOHMH through the Hedrick uh, Martin Institute and supports comp comprehensive mental health services for vulnerable LGBTQ plus youth throughout the city with a particular focus on youth of color, youth and immigrant families, homeless youth, and youth who are just, just as involved. Additionally, the New York City Unity Project unites 16 city agencies and offers enhanced programming and support, supportive services such as trainings and certifications for more than 500 health and hospital physicians and a public awareness campaign on LGBTQ uh, plus youth and their families. The city has also committed to update and improve LGBTQ plus cultural competency training for the Mental Health Service Corps, 
a Thrive NYC initiative which places nearly 400 physicians and recently graduated master's and doctoral level clinicians in substance abuse uh, use programs, mental health clinics, and primary care practices in high need areas. It is our hope that we can provide and strengthen the necessary supports to help our LGBTQ youth remain healthy, happy, and fully engaged in the process of growing up in a safe and inclusive environment. I wanna thank the administration and the advocates here today for the commitment that they have made to make resources available for LGBTQ plus youth who rely upon their services, and I look forward to hearing more about all of the work that they're doing and the role that the City Council can play in supporting their efforts. I also wanna thank committee staff, Council uh, Sarah Liss, Policy Analyst Christy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, and my Chief of Staff Luisa Lopez, and my Legislative Director Bianca Almerina for making this hearing possible. Finally, I'd like to encourage everyone testifying at this hearing who feels comfortable to please share their preferred gender pronouns so that we can address everyone in a respectful manner. My preferred pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'd like to be addressed as Councilmember Ayala or as Diana. I now uh, turn this over to my colleague, Deborah Rose. We're gonna, gonna have, we're gonna now swear. And this is for anyone who's gonna be testifying or answering questions. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. We've been joined by council members Alika Samuels and council member Holden. See, I told you they'd get here. <laughs> so, um, good morning. Um, and again, thank you for, for being here to testify. Um, we heard through both of our opening statements some really alarming statistics that, um, that beg to uh, the question about how many services and what resources are we making available to LGBTQ plus youth, um, and especially in mental health, uh, in the mental health area. So um, I'd like to uh, start uh, with DYCD since um, the youth chair. Um, could you like tell me, we have specifically the runaway and um, runaway homeless youth shelter system, which is supplemented by street outreach teams that often serve as a point of entry into our runaway and homeless youth shelter system. Um, are uh, our street outreach team members trained to provide direct mental health services or referral, or do they make referrals to mental health? Oh. Oh, we didn't. <laughs> you can tell right how excited I am. <laughs> I might as well adjourn the meeting. <laughs> no wonder you were looking at me so strange. <laughs> It's post-budget stuff. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sorry, sorry. We understand. Sorry. We understand. <laughs> Please identify yourself and your agency. <laughs> and then. I, th I think we're all there emotionally <laughs> today. Um, so thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Rose, Chair Ayala, and members of the Committees on Youth Services and Mental Health Addiction and Disabilities. My name is Ash McGovern, and I'm the Executive Director of the NYC Unity Project. The First Lady's citywide initiative focused on supporting and empowering LGBT plus young people through innovative policy and program change. I also serve as senior policy advisor on LGBTQ initi initiatives, and I use they and them pronouns. On behalf of the de Blasio administration, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify today. On this panel, I am joined by Randy Scott, Assistant Commissioner for, Vul for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, and Dr. Hilary Cunnins, Executive De Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The NYC Unity Project was founded in September 2017 by First Lady Shirlane McRae with a core mission of building innovative programs and policies that ensure LGBT plus young people in New York City are safe, supported, and healthy. Our approach is intersectional and multifaceted. 
we recognize that in order to support our LGBTQ young people, we must invest both in root cause interventions to prevent the inequities they face, some of which you've mentioned today already, while simultaneously building affirming, affirming programs and services that support those who are already vulnerable right now. As you know, LGBTQ young people face a range of disparities and equities, including worse mental and physical health outcomes, including higher rates of suicidality, mental illness, and substance misuse as compared to their peers. Our LGBTQ young people also face higher rates of poverty, unemployment, and housing insecurity than their peers. Given the wide range of interpersonal and systemic disempowerment and discrimination these young people face, these experiences are unsurprising, even if devastating. It is a testament to the power and resilience of LGBTQ young people that they continue to show up in the world as their full selves and push us all to create a more just world that creates space for them, despite the consequences, when it is safe and possible to do so for them. And for many, it is not safe and possible. We know that in order to meaningfully support mental health and wellness for our most vulnerable LGBTQ youth, we absolutely must take a broad approach and one that tackles anti-LGBTQ stigma and animus broadly, housing and economic insecurity, and health inequity, all with a central consciousness around the ways in which intersecting forms of oppression, including racism, transphobia, cissexism, ableism, and other forms of marginalization, make some of our young people even more vulnerable than others. We must boldly be committed to ensuring that our city programs and services are safe, affirming, and welcoming, and that is what we strive to do in the NYC Unity Project. Since its founding, our project has made significant investments in a range of groundbreaking programs and services with our agency and community partners, and I'm proud to highlight some of those programs for you today. <clears throat> we have made tackling LGBTQ youth family rejection a key priority, which we know is one of the most, if not the most, significant root causes of LGBTQ mental health inequity. To do this, we have prioritized building programs and services aimed at creating a more robust LGBTQ family acceptance for our young people. Family rejection is the leading cause of LGBTQ youth homelessness. Rejection can take many forms, from passive disapproval to violence, to forcing young people out of the only homes that they know. All forms of rejection can have enormous consequences. We know that family acceptance is an incredibly protective factor in the overall health and wellness of LGBTQ young people, but that rejection can result in a range of negative outcomes, including school absenteeism and dropout, worse physical health outcomes due to stress, higher rates of poverty and unemployment due to lack of financial support, susceptibility to violence, sometimes at the hands of the family members, and notably higher rates of mental illness, substance misuse, and suicidality. To tackle these issues, we have invested in several groundbreaking programs, including a first-of-its-kind year-long certification training program in partnership with the Ackerman Institute's Gender and Family Project and ACS. The training is primarily for mental health clinicians of color and LGBTQ-identified mental health clinicians to help them develop skills needed to mediate family conflict conflict between LGBTQ young people and their families and encourage healthy unification. The second program, we've expanded the LGBTQ Institute for Family Therapy Project, also known as Project LIFT, in partnership with the LGBT Center of New York and ACS. This program provides a six-month training certification process for licensed mental health clinicians working with families that are involved with the ACS child welfare system. Also, recognizing the needs of Spanish-speaking communities and the high rates of mental health disparities in these communities, these youth communities in particular, we have also partnered with CAMBA in their Project Accept LGBTQ Youth, also known as Project Ally, with DOHMH. This program offers educational outreach and peer support groups for parents and families of LGBTQ young people. Through this partnership, we have funded a Spanish-speaking parent advocate staff position and support group facilitator, as well as a Spanish-speaking health educator. 
We have also partnered with Canva to support their social media and marketing campaign, which offers models and messages meant to encourage Spanish-speaking families and all families to support and accept LGBTQ young people in their lives. Recognizing the lack of youth-led and centered research on this issue, we have also invested in partnership with DOHMH and CUNY's Public Science Project to conduct a first-of-its-kind participatory action research project on LGBTQ family acceptance, where young people themselves are designing, conducting, and developing research on the needs and concerns of LGBTQ young people in relation to their experiences of family rejection or acceptance. CUNY's Public Science Project has been a really vital partner in this work and recently conducted the largest participatory action research project on the needs of LGBTQ young people in the country. Finally, the Unity Project has also launched two citywide public ad campaigns, one featuring LGBTQ young people from New York City and another featuring affirming parents and family members of LGBTQ youth, which are up in the subways and bus shelters now. I hope you've seen them if you're riding on the subway in order to destigmatize the lived realities of our communities and to encourage and promote family acceptance. We have also made addressing LGBTQ youth homelessness and economic inequity key priorities of the project. One of the most devastating consequences of familial and peer rejection is the disproportionately high rates of LGBTQ youth homelessness. LGBTQ young people in New York City make up an astonishing 40% of the youth homeless population, 40%. Recognizing that these young people need resources now, we have also invested in key homelessness services and supports, <clears throat> including expansion of 24-hour youth drop-in centers to every single borough to ensure that all young people have a safe place to turn at all hours across the city. This is a partnership with DYCD, and these centers provide LGBTQ-supported mental health services, case management, and programming. We have also made a significant investment in creating more youth shelter beds for our young people, age 21 to 24, who need them, in partnership with DYCD and City Council. Finally, recognizing the need to create more permanent housing solution, this administration has also made significant capital contributions to supportive housing for young people, including units that are geared towards LGBTQ youth. Finally, we know that this current political and social moment of contradicting progress and regression on LGBTQ rights is very complicated. <laughs> LGBTQ young people need to know that New York City has their backs. With a federal administration intent on tearing down years of progress and legal protections for LGBTQ communities, we absolutely must be committed to fighting against anti-LGBTQ bias and stigma and sending clear messages to all of our LGBTQ young people that their lives matter deeply, that we see them, and that we are committed to supporting and empowering them for exactly who they are, exactly who they are. To send that message, this administration and the NYC Unity Project have committed to the following. New York City human rights law enforced by CCHR, the New York City Commission on Human Rights, is one of the strongest and most comprehensive in the entire country. What our laws provide robust and explicit protections for LGBTQ New Yorkers across a range of areas, including housing, health care, employment, public accommodations, and beyond. Under the de Blasio administration, these protections have been strengthened through regulatory guidance, enhanced enforcement, and significant community engagement and public outreach. In May, New York City announced it would be joining 23 cities and states across the country to sue the Trump administration and stop implementation of its so-called protecting statutory conscience rights and health care rule, which attempts to enable and permit discrimination in health care against a range of communities and directly including and implicating trans and non-binary people. Starting in January 2019, New York City began offering third non-binary gender marker options on its city-issued birth certificates and IDNYC cards, allowing all people to self-attest to their own gender identity on these documents. 
New York City Health and Hospitals has made considerable groundbreaking investments in partnership with the Unity Project and others to train our medical providers across their systems, as have so many of our agencies in so many areas. And finally, to kick off Pride season this month, during which we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and hosting World Pride for the first time, we announced that we will be honoring Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera with the only permanent public artwork dedicated to trans people in the world as part of our She Built initiative. Marsha and Sylvia were powerful and transformative visionaries and transgender women of color. They were deeply committed to obtaining justice for LGBTQ communities, particularly trans and non-binary people of color, young people, and those experiencing poverty, homelessness, and other forms of economic injustice. The NYC Unity Project strives to build upon their legacies and to re remain committed to those who need our city services most. Of course, our work is not nearly done. And the programs and services I've mentioned here today are not exhaustive. Across our administration, we are prioritizing the needs of LGBTQ communities, and we will continue to do so vigorously. The lives and futures of our LGBTQ communities, young people and those across the entire age spectrum, depend on us. We never have and never will take that commitment lightly. In conclusion, I wanna share my deep gratitude to members of this committee for surfacing this important topic. And I am incredibly grateful for our shared commission, or, or sh our shared commitment to ensuring that LGBTQ young people in this city get the resources they need to survive and thrive. This administration and the NYC Unity Project in particular welcome opportunities to collaborate further. And I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Randy Scott, at DYCD, and I look forward to taking your questions at the conclusion of our testimonies. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, Chair Rose, Chair Ayala, and members of the Committees on Youth Services and Mental Health. I am Randy Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth at the New York City Department for, of Youth and Community Development, and I go by the pronouns he, him. Thank you for inviting DYCD to testify today about mental health services for LGBTQ plus youth. DYCD supports New York City youth and their families by funding a wide range of high quality youth and community development programs, including after school programs, community centers, literacy programs, and youth workforce development. We expect all of our programs to be open and welcoming to LGBTQ plus individuals. To help our staff and providers reach that goal, we offer professional development opportunities and training throughout the year. Through our capacity building um, department, we offer technical assistance and trainings to DYCD's providers to support their work directly with youth. Trainings help providers understand the continuum of sexual orientation and gender identity and how to support LGBTQ plus and gender nonconforming youth in their programs. The Hetrick Martin Institute, HMI, has a multi-year contract with DYCD to implement a self-assessment tool which they call the PRISM Scan to help other youth-oriented community organizations identify ways to improve their policies and the program environment to address the specialized needs of LGBTQ plus youth, particularly transgender youth. In fiscal year 2019, HMI provided 18 half-day workshops for provider staff. The workshops were entitled Supporting Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Youth in Program Spaces and Supporting LGBTQ Youth in Program Spaces. These workshops were designed to assist providers to foster an environment where transgender and gender nonconforming youth and LGBTQ plus youth will feel safe and supported. Participants worked through real life case studies from their DYCD funded programs. Almost 200 people participated, including staff from Catholic Charities, Phipps Neighborhood, Riseboro, Children's Aid Society, The Door, SEO Family of Services, Marshulu Montefiore, and Chinatown YMCA. DYCD hosts an annual Healing the Hurt Conference in partnership with Vibrant Emotional Health. This conference educates human service professionals who work closely with clients who have experienced trauma who have experienced trauma. 
Every year, several workshops options are specifically focused on helping to address the challenges faced by LGBTQ plus youth. Some examples from the past years include understanding and healing black and brown LGBTQ plus females, attuning to the needs of LGBTQ plus youth, trauma attachment and healing relationships, and creating trauma-informed environments for LGBTQ plus youth, building the safety net for healthy adolescent development. DYCD is the home of the Interagency Coordinating Council on, on Youth, ICC, and its LGBTQ plus work group, which I have co-chaired since 2011. Through the ICC, DYCD has offered training for city agency staff and providers to increase their ability to work effectively with the LGBTQ plus population. The work group meets monthly and consists of 15 members representing city agencies in the provider community. We were pleased to welcome Chair Rose in, as an official member of the ICC this year. Last week on June 11th, the ICC offered its annual comprehensive LGBTQ plus cultural competency training in partnership with the LGBT Center. More than 50 people participated, including city employees from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Law Department, the Department of Parks and Recreation, the Mayor's Office to End Domestic Violence and Gender-Based Violence, as well as representatives from community-based organizations. The ICC has also hosted presentations from gay men's health crisis about struggles faced by trans individuals in housing and employment. The First Lady's Office on the Uni Unity Project, the city's first multi-agency strategy to deliver unique services to LGBTQ plus youth. Marsha's House on the services provided to LGBTQ plus people who are homeless and Destination Tomorrow, which provides LGBTQ plus services in the South Bronx. With the encouragement of the city council speaker, Corey Johnson, DYCD and the ICC collaborate, collaborated with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and News Fest, New York's LGBTQ film and media arts organization, <laughs> a lot of words, to host a special free screening of Saturday Church. This film raises awareness of LGBTQ plus homeless youth in New York City. Following the screening, there was a Q&A with director Damon Cesartis and lead actor Luca Kane. DYCD expects provider organizations to develop relationships with outside organizations and connect participants to their appropriate supports when needed. Programs refer youth to organizations that provide help in the areas of mental health, public benefits, and legal services, among others. This administration has made an unprecedented investment to keep young people safe and housed. Since 2014, Funding has more than tripled to 43 million for runaway and homeless youth services. This has enabled DYCD to fund 753 beds, 678 open to date, for youth ages 16 to 20, and 60 beds for youth ages 21 to 24. We, are also, we also now have eight drop-in centers, including one 24 cent center open in each borough, funded with assistance from the Unity Project and we offer street outreach services that operate in locations known to be gathering places for runaway and homeless youth. All DYCD RHY program sites offer specialized services to LGBTQ plus youth, sexually exploited youth, and in some programs, pregnant and parenting youth. DYCD funded residential services include both crisis services and transitional independent living support programs. Counselors work with youth to develop individualized service plans to outline short-term and long-term goals. They can receive a range of supportive services, both directly and through referrals, which include medical and mental health care services, intensive counseling, family mediation, education, substance abuse prevention, violence intervention and prevention, counseling, and housing assistance. When appropriate, staff members assist young people in reuniting with their families or moving or with moving to transitional or longer term programs. This year, in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, the theme of DYCD's annual Step It Up Youth Dance Competition was Step It Up for LGBTQ plus rights. Step It Up provides dancers and steppers the opportunity to leverage their, their on stage talents to create social change in their communities. Over a thousand young performers were ma made an impact throughout the school year. For example, creating mini documentaries, supporting the local ballroom community, raising awareness at a community health fair, and offering donations for homeless youth. The final showcase was held Saturday at the Apollo Theater. 
BYCD staff and their families are excited to join in this year's March for World Pride next weekend. We know that every effort to support LGBTQ plus youth is an opportunity to send a message to all young people that NYCD, NYC cares about them. We thank you for your support of BYCD and our efforts to support and affirm LGBTQ plus youth. And after my colleague from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene shares her testimony, we will have a, be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Ayala, Chair Rose, members of the committee. I am Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and to join my colleagues from the administration. The Health Department is committed to promoting the health and rights of LGBTQ plus youth and I'd like to share with you some strategies that we use to address the health inequities that are based on sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, as well as race and class. We work to identify and address unmet behavioral health and social needs and to aim to create safe environments for these youth through programs, policy, and our research. I wanna start out by saying that our city very much needs LGBTQ plus New Yorkers. They are vibrant, creative, resilient, and very much deserve to move through New York City as their authentic selves. While many LGBTQ plus people live full and healthy lives, significant health disparities do exist as a result of many structural biases and discrimination, including heterosexism, cissexism, and racism. Similar to the national trends that you heard mentioned and that you yourselves mentioned in your testimony, LGBTQ plus youth in New York City face challenges that increase their risk of mental illness, substance use, and other health and social needs. As a result, LGBTQ plus youth in New York City disproportionately experience mental health challenges compared to their heterosexual and cisgender peers. They are more likely to feel sad or hopeless more likely to attempt suicide, more likely to drink alcohol, and are twice as likely to misuse both prescription and illicit drugs. The Health Department has made it a priority to expand and approve affirming health care and social services for all LGBTQ plus youth. In service of this mission, last year we were proud to collaborate with sister agencies from across the city and our community partners on the Community Service Board to draft the LGBTQ plus behavioral health roadmap. This roadmap is a comprehensive overview of the city's efforts to beh provide behavioral health supports for this community, uh, including youth, with recommendations to guide our efforts moving forward. <clears throat> now let me tell you a bit more about our work at the health department. We serve the behavioral health needs of LGBTQ plus youth in three key ways. First, the health department provides a range of mental health and substance use treat treatment services through contracted providers that specialize in serving LGBTQ plus youth. And we provide services to connect individuals seeking care to appropriate services. Here are just a few examples. We provide contractual and programming oversight for two city council initiatives you've already heard mentioned. The LGBTQ All Borough Mental Health Initiative funds the Hetrick Martin Institute to strengthen and expand mental health supports and provide direct services, including a youth peer education project to raise awareness and reduce stigma for those seeking mental health care. Additionally, the Trans Equity Initiative funds four community-based organizations, the Ackerman Institute, Kalen Lord, Gay Men's Health Crisis, and the Trans Latina Network to provide a broad range of health behavioral health and social service services to transgender and non-conforming New Yorkers, including youth. We fund the LGBT Center, or the Center, which provides a range of services for adolescents. These include referrals, support groups, mental health ed education, outpatient substance use disorder treatment, and substance misuse prevention. The center also operates a youth clubhouse, which is a substance-free drop-in support center and safe haven. 
We support the syringe service programs at the AIDS Center of Queens County, which provides substance use disorder treatment and harm reduction services for recently immigrated transgender women. We fund supportive housing programs for LGBTQ plus youth, including the West End Residence Programs for youth diagnosed with a serious mental illness or substance use disorder. Through NYC Well, our city's help, mental health and behavioral health helpline, trained counselors can refer youth to more than 65 LGBTQ plus affirming behavioral health providers. We developed the Bear It All campaign. You can see some examples to my right a citywide multimedia campaign that encourages LGBTQ plus New Yorkers to open up to their doctors, healthcare providers about everything that affects their health and to find a new doctor if they cannot have these conversations with their current provider. In concert with the Bear It All campaign, the NYC Health Map is a centralized directory for affirming care and includes over 100 LGBTQ plus knowledgeable providers and services including gender affirming, primary and sexual health care, and HIV prevention and treatment. And our eight sexual health clinics offer social worker services to all patients 13 years of age and older, including short-term counseling, crisis counseling, substance use screening, harm reduction services, and referral to mental health and other services in the community. Second, the department works to preserve promote resilience and wellness in LGBTQ plus communities and build the capacity of community organizations and the healthcare system to deliver quality affirming care. <clears throat> and let me share some examples of these. Our Comprehensive Drug and Alcohol Misuse Prevention Program, or CAMP, supports 12 community-based organizations that work to organize community changes that prevent or delay the initiation of substance use among LGBTQ plus and other youth. Our mental health first aid initiative employs culturally competent and affirming staff who provide trainings in community settings to enhance New Yorkers' resilience and to create a safer space to discuss stressors. MHFA has conducted 32 trainings at LGBTQ plus specific organizations and all of the trainers have received uh, specialized training. We developed the LGBTQ Healthcare Bill of Rights, which details the healthcare protections available to LGBTQ plus patients in New York City and directs people to report healthcare discrimination to 311 and or the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Staff in the department's sexual health clinics receive training to provide respectful and culturally competent services to LGBTQ plus and other patients that affirms their identity. And we implemented the Uproot Initiative, formerly called Out for Safe Spaces, which provides ongoing training and technical support to all staff at our department's neighborhood health action centers. These aim to ensure that services are culturally responsive to LGBTQ plus youth in the neighborhoods of the action centers. As you know, the action centers are located in areas with the highest, uh, the city's highest disparities in health outcomes. Finally, the department works to advance policy change that promotes the health of LGBTQ plus youth. Here are a few recent examples. Together with you, the city council and other partners, we made New York City birth certificates more inclusive to all gender identities by allowing people to submit their own affidavit to change their gender marker to male, female, or a newly added X option. The administration also supported both local and state legislation to ban conversion therapy. This dehumanizing practice has no basis in science and no place in the field of medicine. I have covered just a handful of the achievements and initiatives that are underway in, across New York City to protect and promote the health, safety, and rights of LGBTQ plus youth. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important work. And I particularly want to thank Chairs Ayala and Rose and the other council members here today for your support and partnership on these very important issues. And we are happy to take your questions. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> I was just trying to start a different kind of paradigm. I didn't have enough tea yet. <laughs> um, we've been joined by Councilmember Cabrera, 
And um, again, thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank you for being patient enough. <laughs> um, so uh, we heard um, in, uh, in Ms. McGovern's uh, testimony that family rejection is one of the highest, um, one of the highest risk factors or, or contributing factors to um, LGBTQ plus um, youth being homeless. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, for each of you, um, which, which programs are sponsored or you, do you sponsor that um, address family acceptance work? Sure, I can start. Um, and Director McGovern is fine. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, as I mentioned in the testimony, we have some core family acceptance projects that we work on. Um, the first is Project LIFT, which is a partnership with the LGBTQ Community Center and is a clinical training program for clinicians who work with, within the ACS system, with families who are in the child welfare system. Um, so that's one of our key programs. Um, <clears throat> another is a partnership with the Ackerman Institute, their gender and family project. This is another clinical training program um, that, again, emphasizes sort of best ways to promote family acceptance and unification. Um, and the model there, again, is really training mental health clinicians to be able to tackle these issues and their practices. So these are already folks who are um, clinical mental health clinicians, but it's, it's a more expansive training so that they can really get the nuance and dig in more deeply and have the skills they need to help support families. Um, so those are, those are two of the examples. Uh, also, as we mentioned, a partnership with DOH is a CAMBA project ally, um, which is a project out of CAMBA. Uh, and specifically, they sort of their model is um, focused on education, outreach, media campaign, but also family support groups. So actually family members and parents who are facilitating support groups with other family members and parents. Um, and on that one, we funded a parent facilitator who is Spanish speaking, which is not something that they had had previously, but there was a really significant need in the, in, um, the community in which Canva serves. So those are some, some of the core programs that we at least are, are supporting and working on to try and tackle family rejection. Thank you. Yeah. NYCD, um, you know, uh, what programs are, are supported by DYCD um, that do family acceptance work? Well, as you know, sorry. Thanks for the question. Um, as you know, DYCD is the Youth Bureau of um, New York City, so a lot of our um, contractor services focus on family acceptance programs, um, family acceptance. So mm -hmm. basically, we could say all of our programs. Within RHY, as you know, family reunification is one of the key components of um, services. So we, the contracted providers, work with the youth and who they identify as their family to bring awareness, to bring acceptance, um, to bring some type of unification and work around those issues to make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's whole, it's, it's understood and that the issues that are raised are addressed. So basically to answer your question, it would be all of our programs based on the type of services that we do throughout New York City. So all of your programs have, um a, a mental health counselor or someone who who does this work? Um, all of the programs um, may not have a mental health counselor, but the ones, the ones that do not have it have a means to make either a referral to one of the internal programs that do have it or external. So there is some component to make sure that any mental health issues that are raised are addressed, whether it's internal, on-site, or external through a referral. But there is a system in place. How do you expedite um, the contact with the families um, of these young people in order to do um, the family acceptance work? Um, I heard you say that there, there was one or two programs that actually interacts with family members. Um, how do you, you know, make this, this connection and, you know, do you find it to be effective an effective way to, to yeah. address the issue. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the programs that we've funded and supportive, are, we're certainly seeing positive outcomes um, and do think the model is effective. And both, uh, both many of the programs uh, that I've mentioned that the focus on family acceptance, particularly the mental health clinician training programs, sort of have different elements. One is 
you know, classroom education, understanding sort of the clinical issues and the cultural competency issues, but then the other piece of it is actually live action training. Um, so the folks who are in the training uh, are able to work with families sort of like live and then get immediate feedback afterwards from the teachers and the clinicians who are running the program, which is a really effective method. So I think the, the program models are effective and we're seeing you know, good outcomes in terms of what clinicians say after the program, in terms of their understanding of the issues, their comfort with addressing these issues with families. And so that's what we hoped to do when we funded the programs initially, to create that sort of skill set and that more fluid comfort with addressing these issues. Deputy Commissioner? So I'll just, um, I'll echo what my colleagues have said just about in a general approach, which is we support training uh, that is skills-based, that people both learn the information and then have the opportunity to put it into practice uh, as part of their training uh, wherever possible. I'll just add a little. So when you say that, you're talking about the individual, the, the, young, per the young person, are you talking about the clinician? Uh, or are you talking about the family members? So, so part of the health department approach, and it aims at uh, increasing capacity among providers, so whether it's a clinical person or other kind of um, part of our workforce, uh, wherever possible, the capacity building includes um, not just book learning, but an opportunity to practice skills. Back to your question about fa the family, very important family work, I just want to also highlight the, the family work that is happening through council, to the two council funded initiatives that I mentioned. One is the LGBTQ youth all borough mental health initiative run largely out of he Hedrick Martin. And part of that work, and sorry, let me get my notes a little more in my eyes. Um, part of that work is to do something called kinship identification, supporting youth who may not have current relationships with their biologic families to identify other uh, families of kinship, whether biologic or otherwise, in order to assist them to gain additional support. In addition, our trans equity initiative, also a council-funded initiative, I'll just highlight again the importance of the Ackerman Institute, one of our funded providers, who is quite skilled in family work and family counseling, both by direct service and training, and they are offering care to uh, transgender and uh, non-conforming and non-binary New York youth. Thank you. Um, many of our um, runaway and homeless youth, uh, in, well in 2018, funding was allocated to DYCD to um, expand three youth drop-in centers um, so that each could serve an additional 400 youth annually. Has this funding allocation helped serve additional LGBTQ plus youth? Is this funding adequate? And um, are there any future plans to expand more 24-7 dropout centers, drop in, drop in. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to drop in out, drop in centers citywide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, with respect to the funding that we received through the Unity Project to expand, um, it has, there has been an uptick in the number of youth that have, you know, come to the drop-in centers. As, as you know, through word of mouth and folks knowing that operations are now throughout the um, night and not ending at a certain time, youth are coming to, um, you know, to drop in, whether it's to, you know, network with other youth or to receive case management on particular issues. So there, yes, there has been an uptick in um, the number of youth that have um, come to the drop-ins. And in some of the drop-ins, they've had to relocate to different um, spaces because of the number of um, youth that are coming to s on site. So that's been one of the things that is currently happening happening now, especially in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, the funding has helped because it has allowed for um, added services to be provided, especially during the nighttime hours in respect to um, case management, in respect to workshops, 
um, in respect to youth just being able to see a professional to help them with their issues so that they can um, start running once the daylight um, comes up. In respect to whether we will expand, I will need to take that back and see how funding comes in regards to um, any expansion for RHY, but at the time right now, RHY, the services, the expansion that we have had over the last couple of years has been great for not only um, the providers, but for New Yorkers um, who need the services that are being rendered at the sites. Is the funding adequate to meet the needs? The funding currently that we have right now um, has definitely helped in terms of the services that we um, are able to provide. We the services have been increased, whether it's through the additional beds that we've been able to um, online or whether the um, additional staff that providers have been able to, to hire to serve the youth that are coming in and with um, the collaborations that we've been able to have with different partners in terms of bringing services on site or having youth go to their sites to receive. So, yeah. How many borough-based 24 seven um, drop-in centers are there? There are five, one in each borough. One in each borough. Yes. Um, at each of them, is uh, are, th are they specifically LGBTQ and youth? Mm, well, they sp we, we, we use the term specialized. They specialize in services that um, can be provided to LGBTQ, but um, we provide services to all youth who fall between the ages of 14 to 24 at the drop-in centers, both in the 24-hour drop-in centers and the daytime drop-in centers. Is the mental health um, uh, services available 24-7? Um, at the 24-hour drop, um, drop-ins, yes. As well as there's mental health services at the daytime drop-ins um, as well. But they're available 24 hours a day? There are staff who are able to, um, in, to address those issues if you should um, bring them up, yes, through case management. And um, are we able to accommodate all of the LGBTQ youth that, um, that have this need at our drop-in centers? If a youth comes, um, as you know, information is voluntarily um, shared with the, the staff there. And if a youth comes and identifies as LGBTQ plus and is in need of services, they will be um, served in terms of whatever issues they raise, whether it's through education, employment, mental health services, um, housing services, or other. Mm -hmm. Do we track these individuals, and if so, how? And do we um, see if there's follow-up services, if they actually get those services? Um, information is tracked. Um, currently, we use a system called Capricorn, but we are building a new platform, um, participant tracking system, which should be coming online shortly, which captures any information, so a youth who um, identifies as needing assistance and is um, receives case management and through that case management system the contractor is um, responsible for putting that information into the system so that it can be captured and if a youth you know as long as they're part of the program there is a, a weekly check-in with the youth in terms of making sure that the services that they need are being addressed and an individual service plan is created on that particular youth so that there's a, a plan of action of how to um, work with that youth based on what the youth um, has identified as needing. It's all youth-led. Do we actually issues. help them expedite the, the plan yes. so that um, there's some case management and we see them through to, yes. you know, a... As long as the youth stays within that programming, mm -hmm. um, the case management staff work with that youth and through the... Um, sessions that they have with that youth is how they identify what needs to be done, what steps need to be taken, and any assistance that needs to be um, provided. So there is a, a, a built-in case management system at all of our um, contracted programs so that this work can be done. And before, I, I don't want to monopolize no, this, um, but uh, how do we um, advertise? How do we make sure that young people know that these services are available and where they are and um, Great how do we reach, the, reach them so mm -hmm. that they can access this? Well, DYCD uses um, a marketing community engagement um, approach. So it's basically we have currently youth 
Palm Cards, which are distributed through all of our programs as well as to our sister agencies as well as other provider agencies so that youth have a way to know how to access our particular um, programs. This is very easy. You can fold it and put it in your pocket, carry it with you at any time. We also have a um, social media campaign where we use um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and all of the youth-friendly um, me social media to, in order to promote the services that are being done. In addition, we have street outreach, and street outreach canvases the New York um, you know, city area in terms of connecting with youth and providing them with the resources that they need. In addition, we um, work with all of our providers to make sure that they, too, put up flyers. Um, at their site so youth are known. We have different flyers that we have created in terms of um, promoting that. And those are usually the ways that we go the about doing it. street outreach, um, are they trained to uh, sort of recognize and identify mental health issues so that they can make an, uh, sort of an appropriate referral? In terms of most of the referrals for street outreach are made to our drop-in centers because normally at the time when they're doing street outreach, a lot of the um, operations are closed. So what they do is they um, refer those youth to our 24-hour drop-ins where we do have the staff that are capable of making that assessment. So that's normally how the operations um, are run within our system. Street outreach transports to um, the drop-in or advises the youth on how to get to the drop-in, whether it's giving them this information or others that we have, so that that assessment can be made. What's the, pro what's the procedure for someone who needs um, maybe more uh, acute mental health care? If, someone who's in crisis. If someone is in crisis and the staff on site cannot address that crisis, then we a lot, all of our programs are contracted to have linkages in their community to mental health professionals who can address that. Um, one of the, the, the good things is that with the um, Thrive dollars that we were able to receive, the funding, the investment, um, staff were able to be hired to address those issues. But if a, a particular program cannot, they make a referral out, which is um, one of our metrics in terms of um, capturing data. Really is the last one. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, we've talked about outreach. You know, it's very important to me that um, our young people know what services are available and, that, and how to access them. And I think it's wonderful that we have them, but if they don't know where they are or, or what times and how to access them, it's, you know, sort of a moot point. And I've, I've talked... Um, with DYCD previously about being at um, our transportation hubs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very important. Um, when I visited Covenant House, mm -hmm. many of the young people, you know, had come in from other states or uh, they stayed in the subway because they had nowhere to go. Um, and so I really want to stress once again that I think there should be an ongoing um, outreach effort that takes place in our transportation hubs so that um, these young people, you know, know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, if they're not couch surfing or whatever, they wind up in our, in our subways and in our ferry terminals and, and what have you. So, um, you know, I really would like to see all of you, you know, in terms of outreach and, and media uh, outreach, um, utilize our transportation hubs. And, and I just wanted to add to that, because one of the things, based on what you're saying, that we've recently done is we've worked with 311 in order to allow for any of those type of um, questions to come in and they be directed to our um, drop-in centers. So when a youth or someone should call and is in need of particular services, right now, after hours, during hours, they will be contacting um, our Youth Connect hotline and then there'll be um, service. But after hours, it goes through 311 and then it will be directed to, to our drop-in centers, the 24 hours, so that they can go directly there to receive the services. And we've talked about um, inf putting information in the kiosk um, throughout 
um, New York in terms of folks being able to do that. So we've, we've definitely heard you in terms of um, that discussion and we're continuing to work on identifying all of the avenues in order to make sure the information is available to not only you, but those serving you. So on your little referral card, it also, 311 is another um, resource in terms of finding out where services are available? On these cards, these actually give you the direct numbers to the drop-in. So this takes away 311 and just gives you directly to the drop-in. So this is probably um, one of the best things. And again, you could go right into your pocket sleeve, into your purse, into your back pocket, so that you can have it at all times. Okay, so I'm gonna see those at uh, Grand Central Station and and the one train and the, the ferry terminal. We're gonna work on that. We're gonna really work on that. Chiarella. Thank you. Um, uh, this is actually the question is for Assistant Commissioner Scott. So in your testimony, you said that obviously, you know, DYCD expects that all of their programs are welcoming to the LGBTQ plus uh, community, how do you ensure that that is actually happening? Well, one of the things that we did was we worked with HMI um, to, and HMI is one of our technical assistance providers currently, to make sure that they went into our programs to, to see that one, the forms were um, LGBTQ plus friendly, that the staff were well versed on how to work with LGBTQ plus um, staff, and making sure that the, the space was friendly and welcoming to LGBTQ+. So one of the things that we do is we provide technical assistance to all of our providers. So when staff, mostly our program managers, go out to these programs, they check for these things to make sure that the services that are, they're contracted to be um, delivering are being delivered. And we have continuous training on LGBTQ+, as well as mental health, um, services so that our contractor staff, as well as our internal DYCD staff, are well versed and knowledgeable on what to look for and how to make sure things are happening. So that's normally the case with respect to um, yearly flow of. And DYCD, I mean, DYCD serves a, pop, uh, a, a population that ranges in age. Is this something that happens across the board in all programs, uh, after school programs, Compass? Uh, I mean, a cornerstones, all of them, is, that, is this an across the board policy? Yes, because we have a capacity building um, unit within DYCD that works with all of the different divisions to make sure that these are happening. And our capacity building um, division has brought in the, defi the um, different technical assistance providers such as Vibrant for mental health services, such as HMI for LGBTQ plus services and others to make sure that any of our staff and or providers that need assistance or want assistance, assistance has that um, available to them. So our capacity building has been very um, busy in, in terms of the training throughout the agency. So if Council Member Rose and I decided to make impromptu visits throughout the summer to some of these programs, would we find any of this uh, material throughout some of those programs? Would it be you know identifiable? Would it be right in my face? Or am I gonna have to ask for it? Well, most of the sites, and I, I um, invite you to come to uh, RHY site and you can see basically the services that are being provided, speak to staff and speak to um, the youth themselves. But once you go into a site, it's very welcoming. You'll see a lot of literature, you'll see a lot of flyers, posters hanging up that um, share the services as well as talk about the issues that our um, youth are facing on a daily basis. And I just also wanna um, say that not only do does DYCD focus on its youth, it's focused on its staff as well, as well as its providers. So we wanna make sure that it's a whole holistic um, approach so that all avenues are being um, assisted and serviced so that there's no um, drop in delivery. Okay, you also uh, stated that staff are offered the opportunity for professional development and training throughout the year. Is that training uh, mandatory or is it at the discretion of the program? Training, you talking about um, staff at DYCD or at the provider level? At DYCD. At DYCD. Well, um, training is, some is mandatory, some is um, based on the need of the particular um, staff that um, identify. One thing that we've done through um, the agency is with respect to mental health first aid is that we have trained um, basically 279 
um, DYCB staff people. How many staff do you currently have? How many staff do we have? The DYCB, I want to say, how many? 500, about 500. So a little over half of the staff have already been trained in mental health first aid. In regards to the um, staff members at the CBOs, we've trained 1,088. Is, has the training, the mental health first aid training, been specific on LGBTQ plus um, identification issues, mental health issues? It's, or it's is it just like the regular? The regular uh, mental health first aid for youth serve on youth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, it encompasses, you know, all issues that has, you know. it has a little bit of everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make the distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me what the number of beds is per drop-in center? You mentioned that there's one per borough, but you didn't mention how how many beds exactly. The drop-in centers are not residential programs, so they do not have beds. Um, for the residential programs that um, we contract, there by the end of the fiscal year we should have 753. Currently, there's 678 online with 75 pending. Are they at capacity? Excuse me? Are they, are, they, are they all being used right now? We, not all of them being used because we just brought um, some programs online. So right now we're averaging anywhere between, you know, 15 to 20 beds vacant a night. Okay, so you don't have, okay. Um, do you know, do you track how many of the young people, because you mentioned that the, the drop-in centers are not specific uh, for the LGBTQ uh, plus youth population, they're just for young people, right? So a person may or may not identify. How many, do you track how many of the young people that are actually coming into the drop-in centers are ident identify as LGBTQ plus? Yes, um, through intake, they, um, youth who share their identity are able to um, share that with the particular staff and it is identified, yes. Do you know what that percentage is? I currently do not have that number with me, but I can um, get it to you. Okay, um, is there a possibility that you can share some of that literature with some of the councilmatic offices? I think it would be helpful in terms of getting the message out. If I just, um, as long as I know who to send it to, I'll get it to you. Definitely. I will definitely mm -hmm. get that to you. Okay. Uh, Director McGovern. So you mentioned that working with health and hospitals, uh, that you're working with health and hospitals to train providers in LGBTQ plus affirming uh, healthcare practices. Has there been any collaboration with private hospitals or providers? Um, private hospitals, uh, not direct collaboration in the Unity Project with private hospitals, but we have worked with our, of course, our nonprofit partners and our mental health clinician training, et cetera. What, what would be the impediment of, to working with a private hospital? I, mean, I know my, like Mount Sinai has the Adolescent Health Clinic. It right. would be considered a private hospital, but they're an excellent resource. Yeah, I, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague at DOHMH to talk about our partnerships in the administration. Um, I just I want to just uh, mention, and I'll hold up our show and tell, um, um, if I can hold it up correctly. Uh, this is the LGBTQ Bill of Rights, which is aimed at healthcare providers, both um, regardless of setting, private and public. We are, it, this is a strategy to create more affirming spaces as well, to, as well as to outline for patients what it is that they can expect in terms of LGBTQ uh, affirming care. Um, and I'm gonna call up my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Daskalakis, who's in the audience to speak about additional ways we work with private hospitals on this issue and, and outpatient practices. I'm gonna swear in very quickly. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do, thank you. Um, so one of the uh, uh, topics that uh, Dr. Cudens brought up was our Bear It All campaign. But behind the Bear It All campaign is actually something that allows us to provide both technical assistance to providers, no matter who they are, private or public hospital, but also to evaluate them um, for their LGBTQ competence. So um, behind the Bear It All campaign is uh, the option to dial 311 or to go to our health map that it lists an extensive list of services um, with providers we vetted. There are about 120 providers that include both private and public uh, hospital providers who um, we have assessed to 
to be uh, knowledgeable about LGBTQ plus issues down to the granularity of very specific issues like, and I'll give an example, like pubertal suppression for individuals who are, uh, who are sort of pursuing some, of, some, uh, some medical issues around their gender identity. Um, we are currently in the process of expanding that survey and adding more providers. So we, we pretty much focus on medical issues, but we're going deeper into um, issues around fertility and then deeper into issues of mental health as well. So um, the survey provides an opportunity to give that technical assistance, but also to get data to really tell New Yorkers that if you're not able to talk to your provider about your uh, sexual identity or gender identity, don't worry, 311. Um, we have people who you can talk to. So it's kind of a, a double whammy. Like we both do, uh, do the technical assistance as well as provide really good resources to uh, providers. And I'll tell you, um, you brought up Mount Sinai, that LGBTQ Healthcare Bill of Rights is plastered throughout the entire network. They're one of our best. We've distributed about 800 posters um, that are throughout all the clinics, and it's even in their cancer center. It's everywhere in the network. So um, it has definitely permeated through both public and private sector. That's wonderful. So I, now, it, you know, in hearing this, I kind of I'm thinking of my own teenagers that are at home and how the last time that I took them in for a physical, we were kind of thrown out of the room um, because you know this this is screening process that's fairly new or it's new to us. Um, and there's a series of questions. And so I have a teenager that's a very grumpy teenager and not into anything. And so the doctor was a little concerned. Maybe, you know, are you depressed? And, and, and they handed us a, a form, you know, in the event that, you know, uh, that this child felt like, you know, maybe he needed to speak to someone, which I appreciate. But I wonder, is, that the ex is there any, any um, collaboration with the OHMH, like our clinicians? You know, they're, they're conducting the screenings, which are great, right? So that they're identifying whether there are uh, mental illness uh, concerns with the patient. But are, are they then connecting to any of the resources that uh, are being provided throughout the city? Like, what do they do with that information? Would you know? So I think it's, um, it's hard to know. E each hospital or clinical practice has their own routines. I think what's extremely important, good medical practice, always is once you screen for something, you have a plan for when it's positive. I think one strategy the city has taken to support providers is through NYC Well, which has been widely advertised, as you know, and that is a resource that's not only available to patients, but also available to providers who are seeking to, leak, to link their pa adult youth and adult patients to care. I think similarly to uh, what Dr. Daskalakis just described in terms of the Bear It All campaign and the health map in NYC Well, we have uh, 65 uh, uh, LGBTQ plus affirming providers, and if somebody calls with that as a request, we have also similarly identified particular providers with expertise. So, of, of the calls that you that you're receiving through the NYC Well <coughs> network. Um, do we know how many are from LGBTQ plus youth? Um, we don't have that number. As, as, as you know, we, people can volunteer that information, and so our numbers are, we know are much uh, are lower than the numbers that we know that we're reaching. Um, and so we don't have a solid, uh, solid way to track that right at the moment. We're working on that. Is there a way to uh, conduct any type of Follow up with a vulnerable, you know, population of caller. Um, we we do offer with NYC Well for to see if people would like follow up, and so for those who do, we do have capacity to make sure youth or again youth or adults LGBTQ plus identifying or not, we have capacity to do follow up to see if they were successful in completing their referral and. Some people do accept that offer. And do you know the amount and types of mental health related calls that are, are they being tracked? Um, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't are hear you, you. Are the amount and types of mental health related calls being tracked? We do track overall service types with NYC Well, um, and I can get that to you. I don't have that with me. Okay. Um, actually, let's see. Dr. Kunis. Um, in regards to the school-based health centers, uh, can you tell us how many schools offer free mental health care for high schoolers through the school-based health centers? 
Uh, yes, I mean, um, let me just speak broadly uh, about school-based mental health. I think, as you know, the administration has invested significantly in school mental health, and all schools have some sort of school access to school-based mental health services in a variety of ways. Um, I'm gonna, um, again, call up a colleague. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Scott Bloom, who directs mental health uh, for, uh, in, in schools, um, who is from my department and also from Department of Education. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. <clears throat> so as um, Dr. Kuna said that we, in every school right now across New York City, there's some services, some of them are on site. In terms of the school-based health centers, those are different than the school-based mental health clinics. Mm -hmm. So you know, there is a difference there. So there are about 322 schools that have that cover health centers that have some mental health services with them. Um, and then we have about 294 schools that have school-based mental health clinics. Those are on-site clinics um, overseen by the State Office of Mental Health. And we collaborate with mental health providers throughout New York City to offer treatment for individual, family, psychiatric services, group work as well. Are you tracking how many students are utilizing the care? Uh, right now, we, we, we have aggregate numbers uh, because of FERPA and HIPAA laws. FERPA laws dealing with uh, education records we can't get into and HIPAA laws that um, are uh, part of the providers. Uh, this year, moving forward, we are looking at unique uh, services. We are looking at unique kids, but we only would have aggregate numbers and we can get those to you. Okay. Um, do schools in certain boroughs use uh, such care more th more frequently or infrequently than others? I'm sorry. Do some of the schools in certain boroughs use such care more frequently or infrequently than others? Uh, that that's hard to say, uh, of course, because Staten Island would have less schools. Uh, you'd see less services, but that doesn't mean that they aren't using them more than others. So we, we would have to take a look at that. We do have some numbers in terms of breakdown of. Uh, the types of services that we have in each borough, and we, can, we, we have that as well. Now, in the schools that are providing the mental health care, is that provided on site, or are uh, the students referred out? Referred out, right. Referred. Right, so we have, um, we have, uh, let me see if I can get that number for you right away. Yeah. In, in terms of the on site services, right, so the, there's, there's a combination of both. So some of it is where we have uh, over uh, 400 schools across the city that have on-site services so students and their families can get seen there. And then we have a number of services where mental health agencies will go in and do more coaching. Uh, they will uh, work with schools to create a school mental health plan to do prevention work. And then they open up those channels for referrals to their community centers. So there's a combination of on-site services and a combination of connecting to community services. And who's providing the on-site services? Is, is it a certified professional? Oh, yes, right. These are, um, uh, again, overseen by the State Office of Mental Health. They have a license. And these are mental health-related professionals, so they could be licensed uh, clinical social workers, psychologists, uh, mental health counselors, in some cases art therapists, as long as they're recognized by the State Office. Okay, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have one more question and then I'm gonna yield to my colleagues because I know that Councilman Beholden is staring me down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Kunis, in, in fiscal year 19, the council invested 1.2 million for LGBTQ plus youth mental health to be administered by DOHMH through the Hendrick Martin Institute. Can you describe the type of programming the funding has supported? Yes. Um, so I think, as I mentioned uh, a little bit in my testimony, that funding is going to support a, a number of both direct and indirect services, and in, in, I'll just summarize, in five key categories. 
This includes city outreach and education, homeless youth services, mental health direct services, and as I mentioned uh, in an earlier question, kin kinship identification and support. This is to help youth connect with or find family support or kinship support and capacity building and technical assistance and training for other providers. I, I okay. That kinship program, I, we, I recently had an opportunity to meet with a, a young girl who identifies as transgender and she was describing her experiences in a, in a program similar to this and she was there with her father who was like beaming with pride and I, mm. I'll tell you that she's gonna be a, a future advocate and she will probably be running that, that, that agency in a couple of years because she's just so, she was just so, so, so passionate about you know, how proud she was to have found you know, individuals who were like-minded and understood but could help her communicate what she was feeling to her family and her, you know, the, the growing up Latina and knowing how, you know, culturally, you know, it, it's very difficult to find um, an accepting uh, environment. Um, I was just so excited to be sitting there with them and um, really proud of, of all of the work that her father put into really understanding her and uh, supporting her through her journey. And um, so I'm, I'm, whatever way that we can be helpful and in helping to carry your message as well um, and to connect you to as many young people as possible. Please use us as a resource because I think sometimes people forget that we have a really large constituency you know, in each uh, district and we do reach a broad network of individuals and we would love to be considered you know, uh, partners after the budget cycle is over. <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you and thank, thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Oh. I just want to acknowledge that Council Member Van Bremer has joined us. Thank you so much, Chairs, for this important hearing, and um, thank you all for your great testimony. Uh, Director McGovern, um, it's really alarming that 40 percent of the youth homeless population is made up of LGBT plus youth, which is, uh, I think, th this is a crisis because, um, and you know, I'm, I'm really curious as to. Um, how many of those are family rejection related? Do you have an idea of that? Yeah, so there was um, a survey done a couple of years ago by the True Colors Fund, the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law, um, and the Pallet Fund. And this is sort of one of the most comprehensive surveys that's been done on this particular issue. Um, and over 60% of the young people who are experiencing homelessness have said they've experienced family rejection near that amount have experienced other forms of being directly kicked out of their homes, 50%-ish around, um, and around 50% have experienced violence from their families that either made them have to leave or um, they left because their families kicked them out. So it's, it's an extraordinary number and definitely- And it, and it must be a daunting task to try to, especially at the violence, to try to reunite uh, is that it, mm -hmm. always an attempt to reunite the family or sometimes you just say, we can't do this? I mean, no, I mean, I think that decision should be driven really largely by the LGBTQ young person. Um, and the goal of these sort of mental health programs that help um, clinicians facilitate those conversations is really focused on centering the needs of the young person first and foremost and their safety first and foremost. And in situations where young people want to be united with their families or are currently living with their families but want to be able to live there more comfortably and as their full selves, that's really the intent of these, these programs to make sure that they have the skills to do that. So is there any success rate that you have on reuniting families? Let's say it's just, um, you know, um, the family rejection is maybe half, you said, or, or 60%. If, mm -hmm. um, do, we, do we have any numbers uh, on how many have been reunited? How many success stories do we have? I don't have those numbers available. Um, you know, our, our clinicians that we're training are working with many families. So the Project Lift program, for example, that works specifically with ACS-involved families, which, um, and pr in partnership with the LGBT Center, in one year of the program, they've reached over 700 families, right? So right. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great and important question to understand better how these are actually working in practice, but we do know that the message is getting out and the skills are getting to the communities and the families that need them. 
right. On, on, um, are there any, is there peer mentoring? Because I, th mm -hmm. I think that would work. Yeah. Uh, is, is, you have that? Uh, do you mean peer young people, peer parents? Yeah, so young like? people who are, have experienced the same situation, have, have really, you know, um, obviously been helped mm -hmm. and can actually talk to other youth that are going through it. I mean, that's, I, I would think that would, you know, when you connect with some yeah. your peers, you, that would work. Is there any of that going on? Yeah, it, it's a great point, and it's powerful to connect with peers. Um, you know, we in the Unity Project have a youth council that we work with um, to help develop our priorities. Uh, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, we partner with CUNY and DOHMH on a participatory action research project that is youth-led and youth-driven um, and youth-developed, LGBTQ youth-developed, to surface what issues are most important to them around family acceptance and rejection. And that process has been very, um, deep and collaborative, and it's created a cohort of young people who are actually relating to each other about these experiences in addition to developing resources for other young people. That's great, that's great. Yeah. Um, uh, also, I, you know, I, wanted, I wanna mention, um, you know, touch on uh, Council Member Rose's um, comments about outreach, mm -hmm. which I'm never happy that the city is doing enough yeah. to outreach. Um, coming from advertising and, and um, graphic design and communications, um, I think our bus shelters are not used. You know, we, I, I don't. You know, I know we should. We have ads to pay for it, but I think there should be some space allotted mm -hmm. for public service and outreach, um, especially the homeless um, outreach. Uh, there should wherever you know the homeless are. We should. You know, it's not going to. They're not going to pick up a computer and or a, a, you know a, s a smartphone and 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 look at a, a multimedia. You know, presentation. They're going. Mm -hmm. You know, so they ha it has to be on the street. It has to be where they are. It has to be in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's great having all these programs. It's just that we don't really connect with um, our target audience. It's a, it's a waste. We're wasting money, and we're not helping en enough people. So billboards. You know, th I know people people find them annoying, um, but they can actually be set aside for public service more. Um, and and I think um, that that I think has to be done. So on every committee that I'm on, I always say this, but then it doesn't seem to get better. I don't see the outreach enough. I like certainly, we should all in our council offices have ads that we can throw out, you know, up on the window and and really reach everyone or at least more people. Yeah. Um, but um, I and just have one more. Oh, just Sorry. on that point, if if it's helpful to uh, mention. So the Unity Project actually has two public ad campaigns that are running, that have run. We had one last year, we have one running currently that ran on all the subway lines and also bus shelters, directing young people to resources on our website, which is mobile accessible, which we know many young folks use their phones instead of their desktop computers. Right, right. Um, and also um, ensuring that 311 has referrals for all of our programs. So just, just to mention that, Totally agree with okay, you. Okay, good. Yeah, it's great. And we should be okay. doing more. Thank you. Always grab this. Uh, well, I think do I have one other question. Uh, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Coonan's uh, uh, the um, the outreach on the Bear It All campaign um, because I think that's a great great idea and and, and I just went connecting with other doctors. I don't know if they're doctors if they even have a, a doctor, but if the, that they can open up to a, their their physician or but uh, to find a doctor that they can open up to. A, um, uh, how is, is the outreach going in that area? I mean, that, that seems to be another daunting task. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up Do De uh, Deputy Commissioner Daskalakis again, but I just, um, it's... It's a it's, lifeline, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm phoning a lifeline. <laughs> but I will say that reaching healthcare providers is, is central to the work in, in DOHMH, I think, as, as you know and engaging providers across a range of public health uh, initiatives through direct, um, what we call public health detailing campaigns, through uh, giveaways such as the fantastic Bill of Rights cards and so forth are strategies where we as a health department look to our healthcare provider community to do important public health tasks and I think this is a great example uh, in the Bear It All campaign and the health map of, of provider outreach that we do do. 
Thank you for the question. Um, Dimitri Daskalakis from the Department of Health, Deputy Commissioner of Disease Control. Um, so I think we're currently working on uh, um, uh, expanding the survey. So I think that once that survey is expanded and we have another circle of providers added, we're going to reboot the Bear It All campaign to make it sort of public, make it very public and obvious that we've added a bunch of providers. So um, that will probably happen in the in the next year. We hope around Pride. So plans are still on, uh, ongoing for that. But uh, the goal is to keep you know keep priming the pump to let people know that we have uh, have this service that is uh, expressed publicly by this campaign. Great, thank you, sir. Can I get a copy of that of the Bill of Rights there? You know, or one point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Van Bramer. Thank you. Uh, and I was about to say, I think Dr. Deskalaki should just stay there because I feel like I'm going to uh, uh, move into areas where he's going to be called upon. So uh, first, I just want to say thank you to the chairs as one of the five openly gay members of the city council. Uh, this is a very important topic for me. And Council Member Holden mentioned a couple of things. Uh, so I first came out in 1989, 30 years ago this month, uh, and in 1988 I had seen an ad in the back of the Village Voice, back when people read the Village Voice, and, and it was a thing, um, and it was just a small little ad that said gay and lesbian youth group in Queens, and it was at the Aid Center of Queens County. Uh, and I held that ad for a year before I summoned the courage to call the number, and I said, I'm not sure I'm gay, but I think I might want to come by. And uh, they were so wonderful to me. And, you know, I, I think it was really helpful, actually, to come out um, in that uh, peer-led and driven environment. Um, and also at that time, with the HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, uh, really devastating our community, uh, to come out in a, an environment where we were talking about uh, the decisions that we needed to make around sex and um, and safer sex. So, um, and then I went to Glynny, the Gay and Lesbian Youth of New York at the center, uh, which is really uh, was youth run and youth organized, and uh, and it was incredible to be exposed to that experience. So my my question for all of you is, um, how? How are we doing more and better? Because somewhere today there's a kid in Queens or the Bronx, a queer kid on Staten Island, right? And uh, uh, we live in a much more open world and obviously we're trying to reach those kids uh, who may need to take a year as well with the information in their wallet or in their mind to call. And so it's, it's, it's more targeted advertising, right? It's going deeper into communities. Obviously we're very diverse, we have ethnic uh, uh, communities, uh, immigrant communities in Queens, in particular all over the city. Like, what are we doing there? So, in 1989, it was this gay kid from Astoria, Queens, you know, reading the Village Voice, and thank God for that ad. But uh, today it's different, right? And it's changing all the time. And how are we still trying to get those who are hard to reach, even though it's a much more uh, progressive world that we live in, in New York City anyway, but not for everyone? Yeah, thank you for that question and for that history. It was interesting to hear. Um, you know, in terms of what the administration is doing and what's different, what we're doing now versus what we might have been doing 10 years ago, is we have the, the Unity Project, right? So we actually have a citywide commitment to LGBTQ young people that had not previously happened. And the Unity Project serves as a coordinating hub across all of our agencies around important LGBTQ policy and program initiatives. Um, and we are very conscious and committed to making sure that the programs that we are investing in, but the programs that our, our partner agencies are investing in are across the boroughs, are going to hard to reach communities. Um, centering outreach is really important and making sure that that outreach is particular to the communities that we're trying to reach in order to sort of address particular barriers. So the general answer to that is that we are committed to and collaborating regularly and coordinating as an administration, I think, you know, in a way that we haven't before um, this administration. And the various agencies are, you know, uh, advertising in, in mm -hmm. a myriad of different ways yes. to reach as many different uh, uh, LGBTQ youth, uh, however they may I choose to identify, yeah. uh, because of course they may not be identifying as LGBTQ youth mm -hmm. when in fact they see that ad. Yeah. 
And it's another reason that it's important for many of our services that are not just for LGBTQ young people to also be competent in serving LGBTQ young people, since we know that many of our young folks will go to services and programs may or may not be out, may or may not feel safe to come out, and it's important for us as a city to make that space for them to do so. So, uh, and, and here I think we might get into Dr. Daskalakis' uh, territory, but you know, the mental health of, of our, our people and certainly our young people has everything to do with the decisions uh, that we make and, and how we experience our bodies and how we, we make decisions around uh, uh, sex and, and, uh, and other things. So, uh, and I admire Dr. Daskalakis' work so much because it's, it's very sex positive and it's about us embracing who we are and, uh, and yet also uh, you know, informing people about all the different ways in which we might be able to um, keep ourselves um, as healthy uh, as possible. So when you're dealing with LGBTQ youth, some of whom are homeless, um, some of whom may or may not have uh, uh, even begun to uh, be involved in the sex uh, work, um, you know, how do we keep them safe and how do we do that work, right, which is really important, but, but uh, some people will shy away from it, right? And you've done so much great work in making sure that, that people have access to, to PrEP and, um, and, uh, and how do we, how are we doing that? Like, is that even something we're thinking about, right? Getting to this incredibly vulnerable population and, and, and you know, working with them and giving them all the support that they, they need um, but then also providing them with the tools to, uh, um, uh, to get uh, uh, through whatever stage they may be in their life um, and, and do that in a way that they could be 30 years later sitting here as the first you know, trans council member from Queens. You know. So our, our first step is uh, sort of looking at the data void. So one of the uh, sort of clear observations is that historically we do not know very much about our communities of individuals who are, an, um, are engaged in, in sex work. And so over the last two years, um, two and a half, we've been doing focus groups and other surveys that both focus on uh, LGBTQ plus individuals who are doing sex work as well as women who may not identify as LB, L, LBGTQ plus who are also in sex work. And so um, that has um, given us an insight into their service needs and both the Bureau of HIV and the Bureau of STI, which I can speak for since they're in disease control, um, are really looking to align resources in a way to better address those communities rather than assuming they're accidentally getting services in our venues. And so the good news is, we have a lot more data, we have a lot more direction, and now we're, we're looking at how we can use the resources we already have, which are adequate to do this, to actually uh, initiate better service that is overt and, and, and open um, around sex work rather than just tagged on to the sexual health work we're already doing. Right, and obviously, um, uh, uh, you know, a percentage uh, of, of our people and a percentage of our young people may or may not be involved in in sex work, but uh, even if you're not, um, uh, to the Bear All uh, campaign, right? Uh, so for me in my uh, life and experience, uh, when I first came out, uh, we had a family doctor from the neighborhood, right? And that was the last person I was gonna talk to right. about the sex that I may or may not have been having or wanting to have. And uh, and then when I finally came out and was uh, in my early 20s, I talked to uh, an older gay man that I knew from work and said, I think I want a gay doctor um, because it's really important to me to be able to talk to the doctor about everything and anything and not have anyone react in any way other than like, oh, okay, great, let's talk about that, you know? So, uh, so I have had that for the last uh, 27 years. But uh, for LGBT youth, um, right, that's a hard conversation to have, and you may not even know 
um, about these things, and some folks may find themselves to these great organizations like Carolyn Lord and things like that, but how are you reaching them and actually providing folks with even that information should they want that? Maybe not all queer people want a queer doctor, but like me, but, um, but you certainly want to have that option, right? So other than the Bear It All campaign, which, which sort of tries to do that by, by sort of a social media mechanism, sort of just making it you know, pretty obviously LGBTQ with the NYC that's become rainbow and the Bear It All that's the colors of the trans flag, that's all on purpose to sort of get people's attention. Beyond the sort of social media aspect and the health map and the 311, one of our real front lines in this work um, are the sexual health clinics. And so a lot of youth come to those clinics who may not necessarily identify as LGBTQ+, but who may have sex that others would define as LGBTQ+. And so um, under the Ending the Epidemic um, program in New York City, one of our charges from the community was to convert the clinics from uh, STD clinics to destination clinics where people actually want to go to get services because it's better than other places. And so um, part of that is enhancement of social work services, which I think Dr. Kunin's talked about a little bit, but not just around mental health. The goal is to make these environments places where we offer people connection to primary care. And so part of the mission is that individuals who are coming to seek care there have the option of talking to a social worker, or in fact, are, are encouraged to talk to a, a navigator or a social worker so they can leave the safety net and go to places such as the fa fabulous H&H &H facilities that we partner with very closely so they can land somewhere to get that really important and good LGBTQ plus affirming care that they need. So really uh, that front line is really important. 85,000 plus visits a year. We see exactly the right people who are missing in other healthcare environments. So um, that clear call by the community to make these places gateways to primary care is happening. And the last thing I'll just say is, could what's you, that? Could you wrap up? Yes, I, I can wrap up. Um, so uh, uh, let me just say, it's incredibly important that uh, openly LGBTQ people be at these tables. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I ran for office. Um, uh, so I wanna thank all of you for doing the work that you do. Uh, and just say that part of what the work that you all do and, and the funding that you're, you're sending out is to also develop the future leaders, right? Uh, so that young queer kids, uh, like myself, when I was 14, thought I wanted to be in politics, but then when I realized I was gay, I was like, but you can't be gay and be in politics, right? Obviously, we all changed that. But um, uh, I hope that part of what you're doing also is about thinking about leadership right, and developing leadership because young uh, queer kids who come into uh, you and interface with any one of you in your agencies and organizations, uh, um, you know, there are, there are lots of leaders there, right, and future leaders and future elected officials, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. Um, and uh, you've been a wonderful leader. Um, there's, uh, we have three panels. I, I just want to ask um, a couple of light, lightning round questions. Are, um, are the agencies that are represented outside of DYC the, uh, a member of the Interagency Coordinating Council uh, with DYCD? Or is the mayor's office? Uh, we have our own sort of coalition. The ICC? Yeah, yeah, we have our own coalition. Okay. And committee. Are you, yeah, okay, all right. And um, Deputy Commissioner, could you make available the Bill of Rights to all of our council members' offices? I, I think we're a wonderful distribution point. Um, and we have community fairs and we're out at community events all the time. I, I think if you could make you know that available to us, that would be um, a, a great way to get that information out there. And um, for DYCD, I just have one last question. Are there disparities in access to the dropout centers um, across the boroughs? Um, are, are you seeing, you know, um, some drop-in centers seeing more young LGBT, LGBTQ 
you know, um, young people than others, uh, you know, throughout the boroughs? Well, all of our, all of our um, drop-ins are contracted to serve a certain amount. For example, the 24-7 drop-ins are um, contracted to intake 1,900 and case manage 190, and the daytime are 1,500 and 150 for case management. And they're all um, meeting that goal. We, you, as you know, the door is one of our um, drop-in centers, and they're a major um, event, um, CBO in the community. So they, and they have a lot of wraparound services on site. So they see a, a high number of youth in regards to that come to that particular site. So it all depends on um, the the location mm -hmm. and the space size in terms of numbers, but. So they're all the meeting contract. their goal, yeah. their, their numbers. Yeah. Um, and do you find that um, where there is there a need for us to expand those services because uh, we're not able to accommodate the, the numbers that? At this time, we are. The numbers. programs have um, shown that they are able to accommodate um, the services that are being rendered. Um, we're not at a, a place where they're serving. Not turning people away. No, no one is being turned away at an, any drop-in and or residential program um, that is contracted with us. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Chin, and uh, I want to thank you all. You know, you're really doing important work. Uh, the numbers, uh, the stats are are alarming, and uh, I agree. You know, we're we're at crisis level. Uh, so, City Council, I, sh um, I know we've demonstrated our ability and, and desire to address the need. So, um, if there's just one thing, if, is there anything that you think we should be doing that we're not doing? Um, is there something that we need to, to explore? Or is it um, a funding issue? I mean, I, I think community-based organizations would say it's always a funding issue, and the more money we can get to them, the better. The more money directly in the hands of our community members in order to build their own programs and services, the better, which, of course, you know <laughs> and agree with. Um, and so I'd say that, you know, that's a really important piece of it. And at the beginning of the hearing, you had mentioned the recognition that it's not that LGBTQ young people are somehow just more experiencing more mental health disparity because of something innate to them, but actually we're talking about discrimination and stigma exactly. and systemic and interpersonal. And so that, I appreciate that recognition very deeply and it's very important that we ground our work in that and that you all are grounding it as well because it means that we have to tackle poverty, we have to tackle racism, we have to tackle homelessness, we have to tackle all of these intersecting issues right. that create an environment um, where LGBTQ young people are suffering. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all. Thank you. And our thank first you. panel will be? Okay, the first panel will be Amit Paley, The Trevor Project. A.J. Rubin DeSimone, Kalen Lord, Community Health Center, Alan Ross, The Samaritans of New York, Suicide Prevention Center, Beth Wolf, Ali Forney Center, and Bree Gardner, Community Health Care Network. Thank you. And um, do you have one for Council Member Okay. You know what? Okay. All right. Okay. So he'll get them to us. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yes, by, by <laughs> I'll, I'll be talking to you. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Um, would you identify yourself, your agency, and you can begin your testimony? And um, we're going to keep you to three minutes. I should say I, I was not planning on giving testimony until about two minutes ago when my executive director left the room, so <laughs> thank you very much for having me. <laughs> um, so I will be giving Amit Paley's testimony. Uh, greeting chairs uh, Ayala and Rose, and thank you to the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions, and Committee on Youth Services for inviting the Trevor Project to testify on this important hearing on mental health services for LGBTQ youth. My name is Brandon Stinchfield. I'm the head of foundation and government grants at the Trevor Project. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, we are the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for LGBTQ youth. Suicide among LGBTQ youth is a public health crisis in New York City. Uh, according to the 2015 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, almost 20% of LGBTQ youth in the city attempted suicide in the previous year. Uh, that compares to just 6% of non-LGBTQ youth. And half of LGBTQ students reported depressive symptoms such as sadness or hopelessness for two weeks or more that interfered with their usual activities compared with a quarter of non-LGBTQ students. Last year, the Trevor Project's 24-7 phone, chat, and text services reached over 2,000 crisis contacts from across the five boroughs but we estimate that as many as 40,000 LGBTQ youth are in crisis in New York City every year. Uh, in many ways, New York City is already a national leader in mental health for LGBTQ youth. We commend New York City public schools for their suicide prevention policies, which equip school employees to address prevention, postvention, intervention, and high-risk youth, including LGBTQ youth. The city's policy is a model that we encourage other schools across the state to follow. Um, and under Speaker Corey Johnson's leadership, City Council is investing more funds in programs that support LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ youth mental health. Just this week, we learned that the Trevor Project will receive funding from the city for the second consecutive year. Uh, we are especially grateful to Speaker Johnson and Council Members Rivera, Drum, and Perkins for their support. With our fiscal year 19 funding from DOHMH and DYCD, we provided counseling to young people from New York City every day. We are also developing an online webinar on LGBTQ suicide prevention and distributing posters advertising our services to all public middle and high schools in the city. I'm happy to report that right now we are in the process of sending 26,000 posters to 1,100 schools serving 677,000 students. I am not printing those myself. Uh, for years to come, these students will know that the Trevor Project and the city are here to support them. But there is much more the city can do. With the Trevor Project's current level of funding, we are reaching only 5% of the estimated 40,000 LGBTQ youth in crisis in the city. May I finish? Or, really quick? Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, so I will just say we, we hope that the city will uh, consider creating a budget initiative dedicating to ending LGBTQ suicide next year alongside the other great initiatives for LGBTQ youth. Um, thank you so much uh, to the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addictions and Committee on Youth Services for inviting us to be here today. Um, thanks for everything you're doing to support LGBTQ youth, and I have to get this in. Happy Pride. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Beth. Oops. Is that better? Identify yourself. Yes. Uh, I'm Beth Wolf. I'm the Director of Mental Health Services at the Ali Forney Center. Uh, I use all pronouns. Um, on behalf of AFC and the LGBTQ homeless youth that we serve, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to testify today. I'll skip over uh, reviewing the disparity in mental wellness that's already been covered pretty thoroughly. Um, but I do want to say that this year our agency has lost $500,000 of federal funding for our mental health department. This has meant a loss of funding for three full-time mental health professionals at the Alley Forney Center. At present, we have more than 100 youth on our wait list to receive psychiatric evaluation. Our full-time therapists are managing caseloads, averaging 95 clients each. The need for more skilled, trained, trauma-informed, and often most importantly, trans and queer competent and affirming mental health staff is palpable for our youth. During my time providing and managing mental health services at the Alley Forney Center, 
I've realized the heartbreaking truth that my team and I are simply unable to fully meet the needs of the 1,800 homeless LGBTQ youth we are, that are accessing our services each year. Young people who have somehow managed to overcome the stigma of engaging in mental health care, of asking for help, of people in authority, of mental health care and psychiatry, of medication, and of discussing their feelings and trauma, and are able to say, I need therapy, or I need to see a psychiatrist, are then being told they need to wait months to connect to these services. What, have I, what I've also learned is that our youth will wait. Queer homeless youth would rather delay their mental health care and healing, and often their progress towards stable housing, to ensure that the care they receive is with people they believe will understand and value them. The two major factors deterring LGBTQ youth, and especially trans youth, who are people of color, from mental health engagement is one, the pervasive stigma surrounding mental health care for this community, and two, the anxiety associated with the anticipation of rejection and the belief they will not be understood. The vast majority of mental health providers are white and cisgender. There is a deep need for therapists who are queer or trans people of color. Finding a trans therapist of color feels nearly impossible for adults who are able to pay out of pocket. For queer youth, the options are even further limited. I thank you all as members of these committees to support the creation of programming that prioritizes, encourages, recruits, trains, and compensates trans people of color to enter the mental health field. With increased representation will come a decrease in stigma, an increase in engagement, and a deepening in the quality of care that is provided to our youth. Uh, thank you for your time. All right, good morning. My name is Bree Garner. I use pronouns she and her, and I um, am on the policy team at Community Healthcare Network. Um, CHN is pleased to submit testimony to you all today. CHN is a nonprofit network of 14 federally qualified health centers, including two school based health centers and the fleet of medical mobile vans. As part of CHN's mission, it is our duty to advocate for the rights and well being of CHN patients. This includes the right to access mental health services for LGBTQ youth. New York City has taken important steps in preserving and promoting this right, but there still remains many gaps in care. Today we outline several concerns and offer recommendations for improving access to and quality of mental health services for this population. At CHN, we frequently encounter patients who have limited or no health insurance. LGBTQ plus youth become estranged from their parents, resulting in lapses in insurance coverage. We also see that ineligibility for Medicaid based on certain immigration statuses leaves many undocumented LGBTQ plus youth without access to health care. The NYC CARE program is an important first step towards ensuring coverage for New Yorkers who cannot afford or are ineligible for insurance. Nevertheless, we strongly urge the city to consider expanding the program to include FQHCs. FQHCs are integral to providing community-based care for low-income individuals regardless of insurance status and are trusted resources within their communities. Including FQHCs in the NYC CARE program will increase access to direct health services for uninsured individuals, particularly uninsured LGBTQ plus youth, in a trusted community setting. It is a miss by the mayor's office to neglect inclusion of FQHCs in this program. Violations of the Federal Mental Health Parity Act also create challenges for LGBTQ plus youth seeking mental health care. Unlike standard medical services, behavioral health services are subject to a range of arbitrary rules created by insurance companies that limit access to treatment. Foremost among these obstacles is the lack of adequate behavioral health networks and many managed care plans. Additional barriers include restrictions on the number of reimbursable mental health visits, burdensome prior authorization requests, and significantly higher co-pays for behavioral health visits. Critically, prior authorization requirements for medication-assisted treatment of substance use disorder play additional unnecessary barriers to these life-saving treatments. We recommend that these additional, uh, we recommend that these requirements be removed to facilitate access to substance use disorder treatment for LGBTQ plus youth experiencing opioid addiction. We also recommend that some parental consent requirements be removed for standard behavioral health services to facilitate access to treatment. Lastly, there's still a general lack of knowledge, awareness, and understanding of LGBTQ plus populations, specifically transgender and gender nonconforming populations among healthcare providers. For instance, when a transgender patient goes into a clinic, providers may automatically assume that the patient is seeking hormone therapy when in fact they are there to receive treatment for a sore throat. These assumptions and unconscious biases may result in distrust and disengagement in the healthcare system. Today, we highlight a need for improved provider training 
In addition to quality cultural competency and sensitivity trainings, healthcare providers need to be proficient in trauma-informed care. We have made trauma-informed care a priority at CHN and strongly believe that training providers in trauma-informed care is a critical next step. We thank the committees for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, CHN looks forward to working with the city to further improve quality of and access to mental health services for LGBTQ plus youth. <laughs> thank you. Pretty good. <laughs> I'm going to depart from my testimony and just give you the highlights and hopefully you'll read it. Uh, I'm Alan Ross. I'm the executive director of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center in New York. We're part of the world's oldest suicide prevention network. We created the first suicide hotline 65 years ago. We have 400 affiliated centers throughout the world. We run the one in New York City. I want to start by thanking the council for restoring our funding for the suicide hotline or there'll be 75,000 calls that wouldn't get answered next year. So we thank you very much. Uh, if I can indulge, after 30 years, I'm going to tell you what I see. Uh, we've been working with Hispanic at-risk populations. We've been working with Asian. We've been working with homeless. We've been working with immigrant. And certainly for 35 years, we've been working with the LGBTQ community. Whatever policies and programs you come up with, there are certain things that just don't happen. Everybody works in a silo. Very few agencies, nonprofit, and government groups are collaborating and coordinating and connecting. There was just a little bit of water here. The five of us made sure we shared it so a little bit would go far. It's some simple stuff that just doesn't get done. I know there's part of a, con a conversation about uh, uh, integration. We have to remind ourselves as much as we want to focus on any at-risk population that nobody's one thing. Nobody's bullied or nobody's gay or nobody's Hispanic. You can be a multiplicity of things. People are dimensional, they're complex. They're unique, and if we take this singular approach, we don't get anywhere. We've been working with the National Council for Suicide Prevention for 30 years, and, and burden analysis tells us you have to look at people in the complexity of who they are. We would encourage you to put some time, energy, and even the smallest amount of funding to create community coalition for, the, uh, for this issue as well as any other, and get all of us that are working together to sit down. There's a lot of intelligent people with a lot of experience, been working in communities for 10, 20, and 30 years, but we're never really able to do what we're capable of. Um, we also would suggest that we share resources. We've done a small version of a, a citywide resource guide through New York State OMH, where people will seek help the way they're comfortable. You can't dictate whether it's Samaritans or Trevor or Thrive, people are gonna go where they're comfortable. And the more official in government it is, the less likely they are to go. Uh, I think uh, you would have brought up that there's as many as 60 or 70% of the LGBTQ community that suffers a psychological disorder never receives any care at all. We've gotta break down those barriers. We've gotta overcome that stigma. We need to do it collaboratively, coordinated, We've done this with the New York uh, State Suicide Prevention Council, with the New York City Suicide Prevention Task Force. It's happening in communities all across the country. We're not doing it in New York. So uh, we would suggest, and Samaritans is happy, we've been collaborating and coalition building for years to get all of us together, look at action plans, look at shared resources, and if we don't have additional funding, let's at least connect the dots, break down the silos, and strengthen the safety net. I thank you for your time and, and attention. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is AJ Ruben Decimo. Uh, he, him, his are my pronouns. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to the committees today. I am a manager at the Cal and Lord Community Health Center, and I work specifically in the Health Outreach to Teens program, the HOT program. We offer uh, services, medical services mostly to the city's youth, ages 13 to 24. Um, and we do so uh, without charging those patients, regardless of their ability to pay, whether or not they have health insurance. Um, we have some grants to cover that. We offer a full range of behavioral health services in the HOT program, uh, talk therapy, we have crisis intervention, we have um, dialectic behavioral therapy groups, uh, we have non-therapeutic support groups led by peers, and uh, we also have psychiatry. We do a lot. We also have a mobile program that the City Council has supported. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and we do do some really great work. Uh, we also use a trauma-informed approach to providing care. We're very conscious of the intersectionality of identity at play and the historical forces of that trauma um, on our young people. And we also use a harm reduction approach 
Um, we've talked a lot about the statistics. Uh, we've talked a lot about the risk factors that LGBTQ young people have as, in a, as opposed to their non-LGBTQ peers, family rejection being a large one, institutional non-readiness to accept people as they are being another. Um, I want to share a couple of just stories about our patients with the committee, if I may. Um, you know, we've had some really positive outcomes and in individual achievements every day in our clinic, and our patient uh, population has really done a great job. Uh, from one patient, a transgender female, uh, connecting to behavioral health in our program empowered her to overcome persistent and severe agoraphobia uh, that was rooted in her fear of violence that was directed towards her every time she left her house. Uh, another uh, cisgender gay man living with HIV, a young man, he was really able to process the ways in which the stigma of his sexual orientation and diagnosis were having a negative impact upon his life. And yet another patient, a Latinx uh, transgender woman, she suffered from de severe depression related to intermittent homelessness, burdensome youth serving systems. Uh, for this patient who first engaged through crisis intervention services, her behavioral health provider became her anchor as she successfully navigated through this very trying period in her life. In each of these cases, for each of these patients, our providers employed a multitude of strategies to engage the patient. And each of these patients were able to successfully transition into adult medical care services upon discharge from adolescent care. We're an Article 28 Department of Health clinic. Therefore, we provide psychotherapy services and psychiatry services that are, quote, short term, of limited duration and provided incidental to general health care. We have an access issue. Uh, two out of every three patients who need our services can't receive them. And so we, we implore the city to you know, maintain dedicated funding for behavioral health care for LGBTQ youth. Thank you. Thank you all, um, especially for the work that you're doing. Um, are all of your services free or are they a sliding fee? Um, I, I thought your recommendation about federally qualified health centers um, is, is a valuable one in terms of uh, people being able to access um, services. I don't know, um, do most of the federally qualified health centers have a mental health professional um, as part of their panel? Um, so all of our um, 14 sites do offer um, integrated behavior health services. Um, and all of those, regardless of inability to pay, um, are free of cost if needed. And um, yeah. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Samaritan, uh, I appreciate your, um, your remarks. And it's, uh, it's, it's been sort of a bone of contention with me is that we do work in silos and um, there's limited resources and it just seems like it would make more sense if you know we shared resources and and work collegially um, so am i to understand that there is no um, collaborative um, effort or, or coalition that works specifically with um, the lgbt um, popula youth popula population? Well, it would be um, presumptuous of me issues. to answer. To my knowledge, no. Um, in September, there's going to be Suicide Prevention Day. Right. So, Samara, anytime we can find ways to get everybody to come together, we do, but it's very hit and miss, and there's nothing on good. We used to have the New York City Suicide Task Force for about 10 years, OMH funded it. So uh, Trevor would sit on it, and GMHC would sit on it, and the center would come, as well as uh, Communal Life and Hamilton Madison. And at least we would get the people who are, mm -hmm. have some concept of what's going on to, to at least do some connectivity to utilize resources better. Yeah. So, and it's, it costs close to its meeting money and, and donuts and coffee. I mean, it's, it's nothing. I think it's an excellent, you know, um, idea. Uh, I, I'd like to kind of explore it further with you. Uh, DYCD has the inter um, council, inter agency coordinating council, and um, and it brings all of the different agencies 
together. Um, it seems like it, it's just a no-brainer that we have that on um, the not-for-profit and, and side. If I could just footnote, there's things that nonprofits and community groups can do that government can't, and community groups are much more apt to come together under a community banner than under a government banner. Is that a fair thing to say? Not that we just, you know, but we have a different way of operating and we're not so... Um, right. Uh, yeah. You're <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes. Um, Council Member Holden. Uh, yes, thank you all for your testimony. Um, Mr. Ross, uh, I, I, uh, I heard you mention Connect the Dots, which uh, coincidentally, that's what uh, Thrive NYC is supposed to do. And they mentioned that uh, at some hearings that we had here. Susan Herman said, we connect the dots. And, um, and I know that, uh, Beth, you, you lost a half a million dollars in fund federal funding. Um, have any of you seen a difference with Thrive um, funding-wise or connecting the dots? Or? We lost the, the week Thrive was launched to enhance suicide prevention in New York City. 85% of Samaritan's Hotline budget was cut. That's why we keep coming back to you to restore it because in enhancing suicide for the city, they cut the city's oldest uh, hotline, which was answering almost 90,000 calls at the time. Mm -hmm. Today is answering 75,000 as a result of those cuts. We should be answering 120. Uh, if you talk to NAMI, if you talk to Trevor, if you talk to GMHC, none of us were brought into those Thrive conversations. Uh, the trouble the First Lady's having, if she had been collaborating with some of the hotlines that have been around for 30 and 40 years, we could have helped. Because uh, some of that stuff is fair game. It is hard to document anonymous and confidential thing, but some of it is, there is not the level of inclusion and community, from my perspective, in any fashion. And, and that's usually the problem and, and that, that I've seen with uh, government or city agencies um, not connecting, and not reaching out. But connecting the dots is what they do. This is what they, and that, that's why, if any, uh, any, anybody here benefiting from Thrive? The Trevor Project doesn't re receive funding from Thrive. Um, NYC Well, which I think is a part of Thrive, well, does, part of, yeah. does direct um, LGBTQ callers in crisis to us occasionally. Okay. Anybody else? Um, uh, we re receive some Thrive funding, but it's um, funding more like clinical oversight for the agency and less um, like direct service providers. Um, but the uh, mental health first aid programs have been really great and also a really important thing that we've sent our young people to as well for peer support. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, we've been joined by council member Matthew Eugene. Thank you, and our next panel, thank you so much. Thank you thank for you. the work that you're doing. Yeah. Okay, the next panel is Aruna Rayo. API Rainbow Parents P-Flag, Rita Sokolova, South Asian Youth Action, Ju Yan, Asian American Federation, Joy, oh boy, uh, Joy Mwang Hua Hoi, Hamilton Madison House. Um, please uh, identify you, give us your name and your agency, and you may begin testimony. Good morning, um, Chair Ayala and uh, Chair Rose and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, as well as the Committee on Youth Services. Um, thank you for convening this hearing today. I'm Ju Han, Deputy Director of the Asian American Federation. Uh, for the past 30 years, we've worked to raise the influence and well-being of the pan-Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and organizational development. We have about 70 member and partner agencies that we work with that support our community through a range of social services. Uh, we're here today to highlight the mental health needs of uh, what is perhaps one of the most overlooked and underserved populations in New York City, Asian American LGBTQ plus youth, um, in order to urge the city council to prioritize their service needs. 
According to a study that was con conducted by Asian American Pacific Islanders in philanthropy, about 25% of LGBTQ Asian Americans experience psychological distress at rates higher than any other group, straight or LGBTQ, and at rates uh, more than four times higher than their straight a um, Asian American counterparts. Additionally, our mental health report in 2017 found that a higher percentage of Asian American youth um, report experiencing depressive symptoms compared to their white counterparts, but Asian Americans are the least likely to least likely of groups to report, seek, and receive medical help for depressive symptoms due to a lack of knowledge, deep cultural stigma, insurance limits, and a lack of linguistically and culturally competent service providers. Um, this is significant because suicide is the second leading cause of death for Asian American ages 15 to 24 in New York State. When compounded by the stigma facing youth who identify as LGBTQ+, Asian American youth are at great risk of having little to no access to mental health services to address their specific needs. Furthermore, our report in 2017 found that because there's such limited mental health services for the Pan-Asian community as a whole, it's nearly impossible to find culturally competent specialists dealing with LGBTQ issues and concerns in the Asian community. There is currently one mental health clinic serving the Asian American LGBTQ population in New York City. And this is also, it's important to note that the Asian American population grew by 50% between 2000 and 2016, so that the services um, have not kept pace with the need in the community. We know that there's potentially fatal consequences to ignoring the mental health needs of this population. These youth often face homophobia and discrimination not only from the mainstream society, but also from their own parents and families who um, usually have little understanding and acceptance of LGBTQ plus identities. We asked the city council to make an initial investment of $1 million in pan-Asian pan American nonprofit organizations to develop our community-wide capacity in mental health services for LGBTQ youth and their families. Um, in order to, one, develop a training program for Asian-led social service organizations using models which integrate mental health concepts in existing youth programs or services that are LGBTQ accepting, create a network of mental health service providers serving the Asian and LGBTQ communities in New York City to share resources and knowledge about best practices and available services for this population, develop a shared database of mental health service providers that serve LGBTQ youth and their families in the Asian community, and also provide cultural competence trainings, cultural competency trainings for mainstream mental health service providers specializing in LGBTQ issues to better address the unique needs of the Asian American youth community. A the Asian American Federation plans to launch a program this year in partnership with our members to enhance mental health services in the Asian community, um, also including the LGBTQ youth and their families. We'll take the lead on designing and implementing programs based on our research, which will help to reduce barriers to mental health services for this population. We look forward to working with the city on how to address the mental health service needs of Asian New Yorkers, which include our LGBTQ youth and their families. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Chair Diane Ayala and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for convening this hearing. I'm Riti Sachdeva. I use she, her pronouns. For five years, I've worked at South Asian Youth Action, a CBO based in Queens that's been programming for 22 years. SIA aims to foster a strong sense of belonging in youth and provide them with tools to thrive academically, professionally, and personally. As SIA staff, I've developed and implemented programs and curricula around sexuality education and social and emotional skills within a race, class, gender, and sexuality framework. I've worked with youth at Sayas Center in Elmhurst, Queens, as well as five high schools in Queens and Brooklyn, and three middle schools in Queens. I've been the adult facilitator for the LGBTQ plus group at the center and at Richmond Hill High School. Whether as part of a formal group or in one-on-one -on -one chats, I've had the privilege of being the confidant of a number of API LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus youth who are in a process of understanding their own desires, practices, and identity, and in a process of testing out how the world would respond to these desires, practices, and identities. Consistently, API LGBTQ plus youth share that they feel like they don't have a place at home. They're afraid to come out to their parents and their families for fear of rejection for fear of being sent back to their home countries, for, for fear of being disowned. 
API LGBTQ plus youth have internal conflicts, conflicts about disappointing their immigrant parents who have sacrificed so much for their children. They feel angry that their parents care more about what other people think about Think, of, think than about their children's happiness. They feel guilty that they have a sexual or gender orientation that does not meet society's expectations. They feel frustrated about the culture of silence and shame in their families, and they feel scared about being alone with these seemingly insurmountable thoughts and feelings. These internal and external conflicts appear as symptoms like panic attacks, sleeplessness, absence from school, eating disorders, cutting, substance use, and substance abuse and high-risk sexual activity like sex without condoms. These are the default coping mechanisms the youth resort to as a way to numb their pain and forget their isolation. Professional counseling could be a way for youth to have the consistent support of understanding feelings, learning coping skills, and drawing strategies that they may not be able to find at home or school or even in the CBOs that they're part of. However, the parental consent requirement to receive professional counseling is a deterrent for many youth under 18 to receive the counseling that could help them with their mental health challenges. It's vital that they be able to access mental health care without parental consent, similar to the way that youth can access family planning options without parental consent, since their parents may be part or cause of their mental health distress. Outside of the home, most schools and CBOs who do not explicitly serve LGBTQ plus youth have few staff that can use LGBTQ plus inclusive language. Furthermore, few staff have a framework for understanding how gender and heteronormativity make invisible LGBTQ plus youth's lived experiences and future ambitions. Often school and CBO staff don't even recognize bullying language and bullying behavior, and so students become more isolated and more despondent about having any safe space. Funds for training staff at schools and CBOs is essential. That is training that has multiple levels, not just a one-shot deal, but trainings that build throughout the semester or school year and every year. Trainings that would embed LBGTQ plus inclusive language, attitudes, and behaviors into the culture of the agencies and organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Diana Ayala and the Com Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for convening this hearing. My name is Aruna Rao. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm the mother of a young adult who identifies as queer and transgender, a member of the steering committee of API Rainbow Parents of PFLAG New York City, and the founder of Desi Rainbow Parents and Allies, a national group of South Asian parents and allies dedicated to family acceptance of LGBTQ youth. I also have two decades working as a mental health advocate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Our mission at API Rainbow Parents and Desi Rainbow Parents is to raise awareness of the needs of Asian American LGBTQ youth, adults, and their families, to provide support and referrals, and to promote family and community acceptance of API LGBTQ people. We represent individuals and families who live in New York City and surrounding areas. We run support groups and activities in Manhattan and Queens, and also provide one-on-one -on -one support for parents struggling to help support their LGBTQ children. I'm here today to address the mental health needs of the people we serve, informed both by my personal and my professional background. My child, Leela, who's transgender, uses the pronouns they and them, has struggled with depression and anxiety caused by the experience of first having to hide their sexual orientation and gender identity from everyone, including their family, and then from struggling to receive affirming medical support and acceptance from the community. My child was lucky enough to have access to adequate mental health treatment and parents who learned how to support them. But many LGBTQ youth, API LGBTQ youth, face tremendous obstacles, which range from being forced into conversion therapy to becoming homeless. The parents are also frequently dealing with trauma and rejection themselves from their extended family and their community. Um, many of the people I encounter and provide support to need mental health services. 
most of them will refuse to acknowledge that they need these services. They're dealing with stigma on multiple levels, from being LGBTQ or from having an LGBTQ child, from having to admit that they are experiencing mental health symptoms, and from having to seek help outside the family. And experiencing mental health issues is seen as shameful, as a sign of weakness, as lack of strength and willpower. They don't trust the mental health system, they don't trust psychiatric medications. Most people will seek help only in a crisis where there's some kind of breakdown, and sometimes that includes self-harm and uh, suicide attempts. Even after the crisis forces them to use, this, use the services, they may withdraw after this immediate situation is resolved and not return for follow-up. Of those who will agree to seek services, youth may be willing to see a mainstream provider. But the majority of adults um, and parents will ask for a referral to a provider of their own ethnicity. Um, I would caution against ethnic matching and making referrals because in my experience, there is no guarantee that ethnically matched providers will be affirming of LGBTQ identities. Cultural competence for LGBTQ people does not mean just linguistic and ethnic matching. It means affirmation of all their intersecting identities. I would recommend that the City Council fund and support community-based organizations like API Rainbow Parents because we're working on prevention uh, in our effort to create awareness about LGBTQ issues in the community and to try and erase the pervasive stigma and shame that surrounds sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, I would recommend that we provide cultural competence training for mental health providers and also develop a database for competent mental health services. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time and attention. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Joy Long Tsai. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of Behavioral Health at Hamilton Madison House. We are a nonprofit settlement house located in the Lower East Side. We're the largest outpatient behavioral health provider for the Asian American community on the East Coast. Currently, we operate five mental health clinics, a personalized recovery oriented service program, and a supportive housing programs for individuals with severe mental health in two locations in Manhattan and in Queens. Our staff are all bilingual, and we provide services for the Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Cambodian, and the Vietnamese community. In the last decade, Asian Americans continue to be the one of the fastest growing population in the New York metropolitan area. In the past five years, we have seen an increase in referrals for psychiatric care for youth. <clears throat> Currently in the Hamilton Madison House Mental Health Programs, 10% of our clients are the ages of 13 to 21 years old, and their me mental health diagnoses range from depression, generalized anxiety, and adjustment disorders due to external stressors of family obligations, academic pressures, and identity. <clears throat> Many of the clients facing these difficulties have reported suicide ideations due to their parents' lack of understanding of their symptoms and their experiences. For example, we have had a, a Chinese-American high school student who was referred to our services for depressive symptoms. His parents were immigrants from China. After many months in therapy, the client disclosed issues with um, struggling with sexual orientation to his therapist. His, family's, um, his father's response was, was angry and confused. He requested the therapist to be reoriented to the client's sexual um, orientation. Father was not receptive to the therapist's interventions or psychoeducation, and cl um, client's treatment attendance started dropping. After numerous attempts to outreach to the family and the client, the case was eventually terminated due to no response from the, f um, from the parents after the therapist declined to provide conversion therapy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have many cases similar to this, where a young person identifies their sexual orientation and the family members are not supportive or are often angry. These leads to severe depressive symptoms and suicide ideations often resulting in psychiatric interventions. We must provide vital services and resources targeting the LGBTQ community and the youth community and their family members who save their lives. We are currently urging the um, NYC Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions and the Com Committee on Youth Services to not forget about this vulnerable population and address these growing issues and allocate the appropriate funding to increase mental health resources and services, particularly for youth and the LGBT community. I want to thank you all for your testimony. Um, I just wanted to say, um, how do we find culturally competent you know, service providers? Um, I would say that it, uh, culturally competent providers are not necessarily found but made. 
So I think it's actually like a responsibility to train providers, and there is multiple sets of trainings, as I uh, had mentioned. One is, of course, that people have uh, people's LGBTQ identities have to be affirmed in therapy or in whatever treatment that they seek. But the other issue is that frequently I find cultural competence means that people will say, okay, so this language and this language, let's match that. So there's ethnic matching. However, in my personal experience and the experience of many of the parent advocates I work with, ethnic matching does not necessarily work if that provider does not affirm the LGBTQ identity. Mm -hmm. So there's training required on both sets of uh, you know, areas over here. So I think it's really, um, if the city council takes the lead and essentially requires that cultural competence check those boxes uh, for these providers. Thank you. I thank you all. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, one more panel. <sighs> Sorry, folks. Anna Blandell, Christine Bella, Legal Aid Society. Kimberly Calero, Land the Legal. Jeff DeRoche, The Door. John Centegar, Covenant House. Bridget McBrien and Ned Gusick, The Jewish Board. Okay, please identify yourself and let's hear your testimony. Waited a long time for you. <laughs> Hi. You have to put your um, microphone on. Okay, good. <laughs> sure, okay. Thank you to Chairpersons Ayala and Rose for holding this important hearing. Um, the Jewish Board proudly employs and serves people of all religions, races, cultures, gender identities, abilities, ages, and sexual orientations. Today I would like to speak to you briefly about our agency's commitment to LGBTQ plus youth. We serve more than 10,000 New York City youth aged 13 to 25. The Jewish Board has historically been a proud supporter of the LGBTQ community. At the start of the AIDS crisis, the Jewish Board was one of the first organizations to stop off by developing an ambitious AIDS edu education and prevention program. And as the epidemic progressed, we developed a comprehensive, set, a comprehensive network of care for people with AIDS, including free on-site social workers at the gay men's health, uh, health crisis. Our staff of nearly 3,000 has many people who openly identify as LGBTQ+, including myself. And I've worked at the Jewish Board for nearly four years and found it to be nothing less than an inclusive and supportive environment for LGBTQ people. And the support begins with our board, of which there are many, uh, several um, openly LGBTQ trustees, and extends down to all levels of staff. And the expectations that we are an inclusive workplace are set from the first day on the job. All staff have to re review and sign a code of conduct which states our employees must refrain from and, and prevent discrimination of any kind, including that based on sexual orientation. And while there may be instances where staff do not live up to our clearly articulated values when we find out about it, we address them immediately with the appropriate remedies. The, L the agency has an LGBTQ steering committee of which I am the executive sponsor and it is an active force in our agency with trainings, social events, uh, um, and pr presentations at new, um, new higher orientations which occur at every other week. We host internal pride events for staff and clients alike and um, we, they, we, we will be actually We'll be marching in the Pride Fest this year, and we'll also have a booth to promote our services to L the LGBTQ community. Um, very briefly, since I'm almost out of time, while we strive for an LGBTQ inclusive environment across all of our programs, um, we do have a few specialized services that are especially relevant to this population. Um, we have a, a specialized youth behavioral clinic called Crossroads, a federally funded program called Bridging the Gap that supports LGBTQ youth at risk for homelessness, and our new partnership with the Alpha Workshops, which is a, um, a, a nonprofit that trains pe HIV positive people in the decorative arts, um, is just one of the other ways that we exist 
to empower LGBTQ youth. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Anna Blondell. Uh, my pronouns are she, uh, <laughs> my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm here with Christine Bella. We are staff attorneys at the Juvenile Rights Practice, the Special Litigation Unit of the Legal Aid Society. Um, legal Aid is a non-for-profit uh, legal services provider, um, and each year we represent many clients in various courts across the five boroughs who are LGBTQ plus youth. Um, we would like to focus today on the LGBTQ plus youth population that is at risk of or involved in the child welfare, criminal, juvenile justice, and runaway and homeless youth systems. Frequently, involvement in these systems might have been avoided if the youth and their family had had access to meaningful mental health supports. Those supports must be affirming and assist families to accept and support their child's sexual and gender identity. Enhanced funding for such home-based and community-based supports is needed to provide services that are geographically, linguistically, and culturally accessible. Expediting contact with these families um, and providing access prior to placement in out-of-home care or institutions is critical to maintaining LGBTQ plus youth in their communities where they are most likely to thrive. An inadequate array of affirming mental health services for LGBTQ plus youth in foster care is singularly problematic. The population is particularly vulnerable to past trauma, as well as the trauma of separation from family and community that comes with placement in foster care. Um, engagement in these mental health services is often a critical requirement of these children be, being able to return back home and reintegrate with their families and with their communities. Um, and delays and inaccessible services can delay these children's return to their homes. Um, there is also um, a, a need for um, more of an array of placements for these children so they are not institutionalized. So if they have to be placed in foster care, they are able to be placed in LGBTQ plus affirming homes who are supported and provided with continuous training and supervision to ensure that they are providing the necessary care for this vulnerable population. Finally, we are requesting additional funding for mobile crisis vans. Um, we have found that uh, LGBTQ plus youth who are in crisis are often subject to police intervention, which could lead and escalate to needless arrests. Um, additional funding for these vans that could respond to youths in crisis and minimize police involvement. Specifically, um, this would be beneficial for LGBTQ plus youth of color in over-policed neighborhoods, um, but for all LGBTQ uh, Q plus youth overall. Um, and we are asking for more funding to go towards LGBTQ plus youth drop-in centers and spaces to provide a wider array of options for our clients to access supportive community, confidential consultations, um, as well as a safe place to be. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for being here today to listen to our testimonies. My name is Kimberly Calero. I use they, them pronouns and I'm an undergraduate intern with Lambda Legal's Youth in Out of Home Care Project, which advocates for the rights of LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ youth in child welfare, juvenile justice and homelessness systems of care. Um, in front of you is a longer version of the testimony, but I wanted to provide you with some highlights. Um, as we all know, June brings the large and historic celebration of Pride Month. And even though I come from a loving home that accepts me, um, for others, holding an LGBTQ identity comes at a cost. On any given day in New York City, there are about 4,500 youth experiencing homelessness. These youth are overwhelmingly people of color and disproportionately identify as LGBTQ. And even though the city is expecting an influx of LGBTQ youth in response to pride celebrations, um, LGBTQ youth homelessness is not a pride weekend problem. Instead, at the root of this over-representation over and homelessness, like in other systems of care, is a lack of family acceptance towards their LGBTQ youth identity. Family rejection on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity is the most frequently cited factor contributing to LGBTQ homelessness across multiple pieces of research. In an environment that is supposed to be a loving and affirming place, 
LGBTQ are shunned, abused, or even kicked out. This rejection imposes lasting trauma that harms their mental well-being by increasing their likelihood of experiencing anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and engaging in illicit drug use. It feeds LGBTQ youth in a pipeline of overrepresentation in child welfare and homelessness, the need to engage in survival sex, and eventually into the juvenile justice or adult prison systems. While endeavors like the Unity Project are a great start to addressing the overall needs of LGBTQ youth, the council needs to focus its efforts on preventing system involvement among LGBTQ youth um, by addressing lack of family acceptance before these young people leave their homes. To do this, the council should fund training that promotes acceptance and tolerance before youth facing housing instability for families, practitioners, and agencies that work with youth and families. Um, the council should sponsor and fund informational media campaigns that educate families about the importance of family support and fostering the overall well-being for LGBTQ youth, um, but also that educate about the harm and the health risk associated with family rejection. Include the families and caregivers of LGBTQ uh, children and youth on advisory groups uh, for children um, and family service programs and agencies. And lastly, to provide funding for facilities and organizations that provide family counseling for LGBTQ youth in order to hire more staff and to receive crisis and trauma management training. LGBTQ youth need us year round, not just during Pride Month. We all must show our commitment to prevent and end the epidemic of LGBTQ youth homelessness and involvement in other systems. We all must work harder to better serve all youth in our community. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, my name is John Sundegar. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the Director of Development and Communications at Covenant House New York. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to testify this morning. Um, I know you're familiar with Covenant House, uh, but we are the nation's largest nonprofit adolescent care agency serving homeless, runaway, and trafficked youth. Uh, during this past year, we served over 2,000 young people in our residential programs through drop-in and street outreach. Um, and on a nightly basis, we shelter approximately 200 young people, including pregnant women and mothers with children, LGBTQ plus youth, and commercially sexually exploited and trafficking survivors. Um, I know you know the statistics, but I do want to highlight again that LGBTQ youth are 120% more likely to experience homelessness than peers who do not identify as such. Um, and at Covenant House New York, in a recent survey, we found that nearly 30% of our young people did identify as LGBTQ youth. Um, I wanted to highlight that we do operate a federally qualified health center at Covenant House New York, um, and it, within that we operate a mental health day treatment program uh, called MINDS, which stands for Moving in New Directions, um, and we provide evidence-based, trauma-informed care through a harm reduction lens as well. We provide motivational interviewing, um, trauma uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and other interventions uh, with our youth, many of whom identify as LGBT. Um, and I just, I did want to highlight that um, we do have a current contract with DOHMH in which it is just not funded as it should be. Um, we are expected through that contract to serve approximately 120 youth per year. Um, and just halfway through our fiscal year, we served more than that. So we definitely do need more funding, and I urge the council to think about that and explore that issue um, because we serve a lot of young people through this mental health program, and it's just the budget's not there. Um, we did ask DOHMH earlier in the year um, if we could increase our budget to provide more social workers, um, additional you know, personal costs for psychiatrists and things like that, and they said that they didn't have it in their budget. Um, so we're again, you know, we're working with what we have, and we want to serve more youth. And we do have a lot of youth that come to our door, especially who are LGBTQ. So um, I just wanted to highlight that as well. It is a need, um, and I know that a lot of agencies have the need, but we do too, and um, just wanted to highlight that for you. Thank you. Um, at what level of funding do you receive? I'm sorry, what? What level of funding do you receive? Uh, so I do know that our contract through DOHMH is approximately $160,000 a year, but that's, I mean, and we serve many more kids than, many more young people than we're contracted to serve. So we had asked for just less than doubling that, and, and they said that they were not able to. Um, sorry, can I just add one more thing? <laughs> uh, Council Member Holden had asked before about what services uh, non, uh, our agencies receive through Thrive. 
Um, so I did want to highlight that we do receive a social worker through Thrive NYC, but it's just one social worker. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. And uh, one more. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's great. Um, Good afternoon, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Jeff DeRoche, I'm the Director of Mental Health Services at The Door. Um, we serve as a resource for LGBTQ youth in New York City by offering, we have a federally qualified health center that offers, offers primary care and targeted behavioral health services. Um, we also offer sexual and reproductive health services, career and education services, which includes a high school equivalency program and a charter high school. Um, and legal services, structured arts and recreational activities, and we also offer Manhattan's, Manhattan's drop-in for DYCD for runaway and homeless youth. Um, we, wanna, we wanna thank everyone for the testimony this morning, especially all the clinical data that people presented. We also want to caution against over-medicalizing LGBTQ young people. Um, we appreciate and encourage people to take a minority stress perspective, which incorporates uh, the comprehension of stigma, prejudice, and other environmental factors as chronic stressors that negatively impact health outcomes, and we appreciate everyone for doing so today. Um, the disproportionate rate, uh, we were gonna go through a list of the, the disproportionate um, experiences that LGBTQ folks experience. Uh, these include, Rejection by families, which we heard a lot about today. Um, they also include removal from families of origin and placement in, in group homes uh, at significantly higher rates than their non-LGBTQ peers. Um, homo and transphobic bullying. Uh, incarceration at, at disproportionate levels compared to LGBTQ peers or non-LGBTQ peers and stigma in healthcare environments. This is a really important one for me working in the mental health field. Um, the vast majority, of, or the LGBTQ youth young people report that the number one barrier to accessing care is in cultural incompetence on the part of medical and mental health providers. Um, these young people deserve interventions that address their deficits and barriers while allowing for safe, affirmative socialization, identity development, self-advocacy, and leadership opportunities. So what we encourage today are targeted engagement and educational work with families, increased research, policy, and programming specific to LGBTQ people with intersectional identities that compound the minority stressors they experience. This includes rigorous attention to race, disability, socioeconomic status, and other factors that can, compl that can complicate and intensify negative health outcomes. We also encourage intersectional LGBTQ affirming educational curricula in all school settings anti-bullying policies and appropriate enforcement of those policies in schools and community programs supported by legislation. Rigorous as opposed to gestural uh, staff training and cultural competence and cultural humility uh, in, in medical and mental health environments, community settings, schools and government agencies. And finally, LGBTQ leadership and advisory board opportunities in all settings that engage with young people. We also thank you for your questions about funding. We obviously do services that are reimbursable by Medicaid, but those services are, are very limited and structured. And what we really need funding for is innovative and creative programs that reach young people where they're at. And we want to encourage you to give us money to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all. You're doing a, a great job with not enough resources. Uh, thank you for your patience. And this hearing is adjourned one o'clock. Thank <laughs> you.